Hello folks and welcome to today's show with myself Shane Spades and joined as ever by Michael Burney. Uh Michael was busy all weekend there, obviously in office we both know. Um just have you got the music there flying in the background or what's going on? I can't get can't get enough of it to be honest with you, yeah. Um, yeah, I, have, you're, you're I, always... that, I play I play that music just even when, when I'm rocking around the house now. To be honest, did you have that at your wedding? I know you had it over there in <laughs> Houston somewhere. For, first time, <laughs> herself coming down the aisle to that, and you were there like this up at the top of the room. <laughs> well, look, a reminder: we're brought to you by orgaretro.com. Use the promo code our game, and you'll get fifteen percent off. Loads of comments coming in already. Yeah, look at this little. We won't be seeing this Wexford one for a while. That's why I've. Um, that's why I've worn that today. The likes of the Clare one you won't see for a while as well. Um, we're going to go into all of those different fixtures. But I'll just start off with one or two comments. One is from Joe Butler here. He says, well done to my old uh, alma mater, St. Kieran's, and winning the Crow Cup for the 24th time. Fully deserving winners against that and Rye. A very, uh, he goes on to uh, talk about the game yesterday. A very poor game between Kilkenny and Waterford. Lots of errors, fumbling, poor passing, and bad shooting from both sides. Conditions were hard for the players, but there, uh, but there was some awful stuff there. So, uh, what was your story the weekend? No, very little story. Trying to uh, trying to recover after Cheltenham, probably the, one of the hardest weeks of the year. Uh, Financially, as well, no? Uh, no, no, no. I wouldn't even bo- I wouldn't even bother with that because you just end up taking your mind off what you're actually supposed to be over there doing. I've been over there as a punter before. A bit of a different experience than being over there uh, working. But it was actually, I got out on the track and was standing right beside the last fence for the Gold Cup, which was pretty cool. Um, which I'd say, more, you know, a racing fan would probably pay a good few pounds to stand there. But no, a good week. Uh, it was grand just to kind of kick the feet up and watch the matches. But I have to say, Kenny and Watford was chewing them on the ice at different stages. It was really tough game, tough game to watch. Riddled with mistakes, tough chewing conditions. Chewing on the ice is a positive thing. How is chewing them on the ice a positive thing? Well, I've heard it that like, uh, so for example, let's say you watch a really dumb action movie. It's sort of like, take the brain out, park to one side and it's just chewing them for the ice. Oh jeez, I would have said uh, that in no way could a positive could having chewing gum on your eyes or over your eyes be a positive thing but maybe uh listen listen maybe one of our viewers will tell us it was it was a tough watch i had i will say that it was a very very tough watch um you'd have to give credit to, to nisha waldron for acting like it was a good game though he was doing co-commentary on tg car to be oh, fair to be, yeah to be fair kind of that's uh you kind of have to do that and even when you're working at something like that you would try and probably put a positive spin on it but it was uh yeah, it was it was a hard watch. Conditions probably didn't make it uh didn't make weren't very conducive for a good game as well. But the amount of mistakes on both sides, like yeah, so many like little, small, even simple kind of mistakes. But Kilkenny are true to the to the last four, get another game, get to probably maybe the, maybe t- maybe TJ might be back for a, a, a semi final, might come on at some stage and they'll probably uh get a bit more time for some of the Bally Hale lads, but uh what it wasn't the best, it wasn't the best weekend of GEA, I'd, I'd put it to you that way. And once you get towards this latter stage of the league, it's probably going to be like that as well because some teams are just looking to survive and not at all, so others are maybe looking to power on to a semi final, and some are not looking to get to a semi final at all. And just want to, like, I think Dar Egan's happy to have his league finished now by the yeah. sounds of things. And with the injury list he has, I probably can't blame him either. Different, different teams seem to be in different positions now. Isn't it interesting, though, that three of the four teams that are in the league semi-finals have new managers? And because there was such a manager turnover, that was obviously going to happen to some degree anyway. It wasn't it something like five different managerial changes at the top level? But three of the four, plus John Kiley, who's the most experienced one left. I'd say Liam Cahill's delighted to have another game. I'd say oh, Pat yeah. Ryan, maybe injury issues aside, he, he wants to have another game. He doesn't want to risk any more injuries, but he wants another game to develop what he's doing. Um, I'll read out a couple of the comments we have coming in here already. Uh, Cash is king. Could be wrong, but I reckon Davy is trying to fool everyone the way he's been using Desi Hutchinson and Ozzy Gleason coming off the bench in earlier parts of the league. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later we on. We definitely will. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Powell K says, is there a more headless player in hurling than David Fitzgerald? Does daft things every season and acts the price when rest take action? Awful stroke in Munster final last year too. Again, we'll talk about that later on. That's the Claire, uh, Claire attacker who was sent off against Cork currently looks like he's going to miss the Tipperary clash in Munster, which I'm devastated about. No, he's obviously a brilliant player, so that would be a huge blow to Clare. Would love to see Tip uh, tear into Limerick next weekend, first off, to get to get an idea where we're at. And it feels like chance to lay down a marker like the 9 league final against Kilkenny. Let's not get carried away just yet. But yeah, I kind of know where you're coming from. I'm looking, really looking forward to that game, though, I have to say. Really, yeah. Because... Uh, 
listen, I think once Limerick are at this stage, I think they'll just try and power on and win the league. And they're reintegrating players. Galan played 55 minutes. Burns played the guts of an hour. They're getting a few other lads back as well. Hannon played his first game in a while. And you have a tip team who are... Yeah, I don't know if it's about making a statement. I think it's just a matter of the train is firmly back on tracks now and on the track now. They did a really good performance in, in Antrim even over the weekend. Real... Um, Rootless. There's a rootless. There is a rootless streak to them, and I'm sure they, you know, they've been very competitive with Limerick at different stages over the last couple of years. Like you have to say, they've probably been one of the most competitive teams against them, and even they're they're able to put them on the back foot for about 55 minutes the other day, uh, or last year I should say in the Munster Championship. They obviously had that brilliant half an hour against them a couple of years ago in the Munster final. So I'm sure they're going to try and see what they can learn when they play when they play them in Munster. I'm actually really looking forward to that game. Probably a lot more than the than the Cork Hill Kenny game, uh, just because I think you have obviously the standard bears going up against you know a team that looked to have bounced back really really well under Liam Cal. Yeah, I'm I'm very interested to see this game and that you've kind of put your f- finger on it there. Tipperary have competed with Limerick, but not for the 70 minutes. I even go all the way back to the 2019 Munster final. Tip were good for about. 15 or 20 minutes and then got absolutely annihilated for the rest of the game. So it's keeping with them, keeping the game plan going. Yeah. Go ahead. Here's one for you. Um, there's probably a decent bit of symmetry between this league semi-final and the one when they, where they played in 2018. Where Limerick, the the were, yeah, yeah, where Limerick were the ones, not trying to make a statement, but they were, Limerick were the ones. I remember I remember actually sitting beside you for that game and we were mm. both really impressed with Limerick. I remember Galan had a real had a bad enough ankle injury and stayed playing, but uh, Jason Ford got a deadly goal, I think, to win it at the end. But Tip were the team that were up there. They were after being All-Ireland champions in 16. They were obviously beaten in semi-final in 17. And Limerick were the up-and-coming team. They weren't even an up-and-coming team really at the time. Like We didn't, we didn't think what was going to materialise there after it's happened and they came away with an awful lot of credit and I'd say that was a huge game even towards the latter end of the year just to know that they could compete at the highest level so the boots probably kind of on the other foot I'd say going into this weekend but I yeah I don't expect any sort of phony war in that game yeah absolutely no I agree with that particular performance being a bit of a I suppose one of those confidence infusing uh, performances for Limerick they took Tipperary all the way to extra time in their own home ground and I remember one of the goals that Tipperary got, wasn't it two quick goals? And one of them was they tried a, a short puck out, yeah. got turned over. And that maybe be, was when Jason Ford blasted it to the net. How many times have they been turned over in short puck outs for goals since? Very few. Just on more. that with Limerick as well. I, I don't know if you've noticed anything with their short puck outs this year. You know the way it used to be like four or five years ago? is to go on the car back, gets the ball. Oh, take your steps and look up or whatever. Limerick's, um, like the ball is played to the, the first receiver, as they call it now. It's almost like a stick pass straight away, nearly without even looking. It's like um, teams are trying to give them the ball and turn that into an advantage for, you know, the opposition team. And they're just like, no, 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 we're going to get the ball, bang, bang, and they're going to be up around the 65 straight away. I just think that transition looks even quicker this year than previous years. Yeah, Joe Butler says, is there any significance in David Clifford joining the Sox Up Brigade of TJ, Walter, Seamus Flanagan, etc.? Is this a new trend? It looks well on some lads, and to be honest, I hope it's here to stay with Clifford. Yeah, it, I always think it makes a lad look bigger. Uh, and if you're around 6'1", 6'2", I think it makes you grow even a couple of inches again. I, I liked it now, I have to say. The goal he got the other night was outrageous. Oh, it was the ball through from Brosnan. And just that finish, I don't think many footballers would even try that finish nowadays. They try and create, like, the, either really narrow angle to shoot into. Um, but I, yeah, certain players can pull it off, certain players can't. Like, you have to be, you have to be willing to make the effort as well. It's not just a matter of pulling your socks up because they'll fall down straight away. You have to, have to pull, you have to pull them up, you have to pull them up the full way. You have to tape it, and then you have to pull the flap back, kind of back down. Do you know what I mean? So there's a bit of effort in it. Yeah, you make it sound like a nightmare. Did you ever do it? <laughs> or like, if you're what five six like yourself, does it make you look short? <laughs> uh, I never tried it. No, it, it, I just, I just, no, it'd be, too, it'd be too much effort. There is a bit of effort in it now. What about the the sort of totty or Trent Alexander Arnold look now, where you have it halfway up the calf? Now, I suppose everyone is wearing the, the midi socks now, so they're kind of like that as well, but not quite as pronounced as the tatty look. Yeah, it's funny because we played a county final in, in 2016 with Burr and everyone uh, everyone got, I think everyone bar three of us, 
got the short socks. And we think it was myself, Barry Whelan, and, and Brian Watkins got the long socks. And I, I wouldn't go near long I wouldn't go near long socks now. I actually like the smaller ones, just up midway through the calf. But uh it's just funny that the old school lads will still wear, you know, the bit like they're they look horrible now in hindsight compared to what, what's out now. But when Offaly played in the two thousand All Ireland final, Brian Wheelan wore one sock pulled up, his right one, and Kevin Martin, who was wearing seven, wore I think his left sock pulled up. So it was obviously something that they'd agreed beforehand, but it was a bit of a strange one. If you look at DJ Carey's goal, you see Brian Wheelan chasing after him with one sock up. Uh, a different take on it. Now, I don't see that catching on somehow. Uh, Patrick Coleman says, between the big three, Tip Cork and Kilkenny, Limerick may come undone. But when do you mean, Patrick? Do you know what I mean? Ultimately, one of them will. Big, big four now. Is it a traditional four? Have, have Limerick been doing it long enough to break into that traditional three? Ah, I think there's probably still about 20 odd Ireland's off, to be fair. Re- realistically, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, big three is now Limerick, Limerick B, and Galway says, Pa, okay. God, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have Galway in the big three anyway, would you? At the moment. Oh, God, no. Oh, God, no. no. Not at the no. moment, anyway. Uh, Grodo Grakon says, Munster footballer uh, seemed to be the biggest loser of the weekend. Three Munster teams relegated. Cork's lost to Louth. Seems Munster teams regressing behind Kerry. I mean, that could be a case of what happened with the opposition to Dublin within Leinster, that they're getting pummeled for years, and then ultimately it just feels a little bit like, I suppose even without thinking about it, the teams are almost kind of taking a backward step, almost giving in. I, I look at Tipperary and the amount of players that aren't there from a couple of years ago, and I kind of wonder, did maybe, not all, obviously, because there's injuries, did one or two sort of be like, well, look, we got all we can get out of this, we got a monster title, and one or two are like, Do you know what, I'm happy enough with that. Maybe so. Um, when you're looking at that kind of 2020 monster success, like everything fell perfectly probably for Tipperary and you had everyone you wanted to. You had Colin O'Reardon back, you had Michael Quinlivan back. Just look at the, the personnel that they're missing now. Like it's chalk and cheese really from, from now and three years ago. Uh, PL74 says, it's strange how Shane put up videos of David Fitzgerald and Kyle Hayes sending off, but no video of Michael Breen kick on Bennett. I still haven't seen it. And somebody like now and again would have someone... Um, reply to me saying, "What about that?" And I'm like, "Will you send me a link?" Because I still actually haven't seen it. Have you seen? Yeah, it? no, I didn't. I didn't see that one now, and I didn't see it going around either. You'd normally see bits and pieces kind of floating around. I didn't see it. someone commented. I think that about that last week as well. Like, I still haven't seen that now. I have to say, and I watched the game. Yeah, send on the link. Mikey K says the football league is always more interesting than the hurling league, whereas the hurling uh, championship usually tops the football championship. But again, I mean, look, let's not get into structure talks, but I think that is the the issue with it. Uh, do you want to start us off with some of the news that we have in, in recent days? Yeah, uh, a big blow for Galway. And this is probably another thing kind of leading into why Galway, you know, not might struggle this year, but this uh, not having David Burke going forward for the championship is a big blow. He suffered uh, an ACL rupture in training during the week. And kind of having you know, recommitted for 2023 to suffer that type of a blow, you know, in his early 30s. Um, you'd probably wonder whether he'd be back with Galway again next year, even the timing of it now, you know, March time, you'd be doing well to be getting back fully fit by January, February next year, realistically. So, for you know... When you'd be for, 34 at that stage, you know, that's yeah. a big, big ask. Now, I, I wouldn't put it against him, four-time All-Star. He's obviously, you know, a person who'd... Um, dedicates himself to it but it's a big ask for a guy at 34 yeah no it's it's going to be a tough one and i just even for thomas's he's going to be missing for thomas's as well there's like there's there's no conceivable way that he's going to be able to get back read it realistically during during that time frame uh so very very tough blow for him like he's obviously he was their captain in 2017 and i would say last year he he, he was probably never going to get back to that 2016 17 18 form but he wasn't far off it last year and he was crucial for them. Um, so that's a big, big blow for them. Big blow for Henry Shefflin. One of their more experienced players who they have relied on, you know, they do rely on their experienced players a lot. And it's going to be a big blow not to have them. Yeah, Adam Screeny was on fire. We'll talk a little bit of schools now, but Adam Screeny, the, the, I suppose he's a hope certainly going forward for Offaly, but he continues to deliver in different competitions. Definitely, yeah. He uh, he scored two thirteen the other day in the All Ireland uh, B Colleges final that Colossine of Cormac won. I think it was two thirteen out two seventeen. So he's been top scorer in the Leinster Colleges A final, Leinster Colleges B final, last year's Leinster Championship or last year's Leinster final, I should say, and last year's All Ireland final as well. And like for such a small kind of impish type player, um, 
size hasn't caught up with him yet anyway, but he definitely will fill out. But he has all that kind of, yeah, he just has all the touches. And uh, it's going to be really interesting over the next couple of years to see if he's able to fill out and, you know, potentially what sort of an impact he can make at uh, at senior level. But he's de- he's definitely absolutely lighting it up in every in every competition he plays at the moment, be it club, yeah. or, be it club county or college. Yeah, and then St. Kieran's had a 313 to 12 points win over Presentation College, Athen Rye, Anthony Ireland Wall, Donna Murphy, and Ted Dunn. They all got the goals. So it was the Kilkenny School's eighth consecutive national decider. Uh, and like when you look at it, you know, they didn't go and win Leinster, and here they are now picking up yet another title. Who's doing all that rummaging? Is that the dog? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's gone a bit mad this morning. <laughs> and I kind of thought. The Offaly schools were very good in the Leinster final, but Cairns probably underperformed, I'd say. And their ability in... Re- I don't think they've won a Leinster since 2019, but they've won a couple of All-Irelands within that time as well. Th- this is probably the real killer for a lot of opposition teams that, you know, if Cairns are beaten once, that a team of that calibre, with that know-how at All-Ireland level, are able to get back into it and are able yeah. to win the all Ireland. Do you know what I mean? Wasn't it the same with uh, our school reach were beaten by... Hard school reach were beaten Tulla. by Tulla, yeah, in the Hardy fight, Hardy Cup final. And then they ended up winning the All Ireland as well, didn't they? But that was last year. Do you know, you, it, it'd be like beating Limerick in a, in a like it, this could happen this year conceivably that Limerick will be beaten in a Munster Championship match or a Munster final, but then you still have to go and beat them again. Like, are Limerick going to get? Here's one for you: Are Limerick going to get beaten? Can Limerick get beaten twice in this year's Championship? If you get me. Yeah, as in, like, is it possible that, you know, twice that they'll, that the, yeah, look, I think that would be a very, very big ask. But, like, have teams pushed them enough in recent years? I mean, imagine what, like, is in, okay, so I don't think Tipperary have pushed them in the last couple of years to say those previous performances would suggest Tip will beat them. Now, going on what we've seen so far and whatever we see this weekend, then maybe we can start building up to say Tip are actually back. But Clare have definitely done enough to suggest that maybe they could beat them. Kilkenny's performance in the All-Ireland final last year would suggest maybe they have a shot at beating them, but of course they've lost a few players, so that's definitely a blow. And then Galway have done, you know, they've done pretty well against them in recent times also. But to, to see them being beaten twice, like there's other teams as well. Cork have obviously beaten them a couple of times as well. And um, I'd say Waterford or Field, there's a bit of a chance for them too. I don't know, very tough ass to see them beaten twice. For a Kilkenny, would say, or a Galway, the only time they could beat them is a knockout game where they're never going to have to play them again that year. Whereas yeah. for a Clare or a Tip or a Cork or whoever, you know, if they beat them in Munster in a round robin game or they beat them in a Munster final, there's a distinct possibility that they're going to have to beat them again at some stage. I just, I just think if they were beaten, like I think I, I look at their ability to regroup within a game when things are going wrong. And I think, geez, like I don't know if there's ever been a better team to do this. Um, even the Dubs, I don't know if if they've reacted as well, like in-game. I don't know, I, I can't think of a Dublin football game, should we say, in their pomp, where they were able to come back from what Limerick were down against Tip a couple of years ago in the Munster final. Do you know what I mean? They've regrouped on real well. So how would they regroup if they were beaten in a game and had a chance to play them again or had a chance, you know what I mean? Yeah. They got, if, I, I don't, I, I from a Limerick point of view, I don't think necessarily it would be a bad thing if they were beaten in Munster. Or a bad, you know, or in a, be it a round robin game, or be it a monster final, um, and any if there's any sign or hint of complacency, that would be completely knocked off. Then, and I, I don't, I put it this way, I don't think the same team is going to beat them twice in 2023. Okay, Richard Hogan says lots of slipping in Nolan Park yesterday. Playing the Camogie match beforehand probably didn't help along with the rain that followed. So that was Kilkenny against Cork in the Camogie. Uh, Hurland one two three four says was that Cork v Clare. Cork had seven players on the age of 22 against a full strength Clare team. Cork midfield of Roach and Toomey snuffed out Tony Kelly to an extent. Power and Hayes, very good up front. We're just about to talk about that game. Fair play to Downey not going down. A stark contrast to the Clare freaks, says N. Cren. Uh, oh. Michael, Michael, <laughs> what's, your fr- what's your friend's name? Is that a Labrador, says Porter Porter? No, no, a little, a little Shih Tzu, Lulu. Um, yeah, she's, she's turning one pretty soon. <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> what, what have you planned for her? She's all grown up. Uh, I don't have much planned, but uh, Elaine has a party planned, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrick Coleman, this is back to who the, I think his top three and four are. I think Cork, Tip and Munster could take Limerick and all three to come out of Munster and Kilkenny to make the semi-final along with Cork and Tip. No easy game waiting. Hi, guys. Any news on Ronan Maher? So he came off early against Antrim. I believe that was just a precaution 
I hope that was a precaution because I haven't seen him playing as well and looking in such good shape for quite some time. So yeah, maybe. I think I think Cork, uh, I think both Seamus Hannity and Declan Dalton had slight hamstring worries um, and they were taken off straight away by all accounts. Both of them were flying in the first half of that game. Um, we might just get into that game now because I believe it was a brilliant first half, really, really high scoring first half. And then it was an absolute phony war in the second half. It finished 8-6 or something in the second half and then they ended level. Um, and as you say there, as one of the commenters said, like, I don't, like, we talked about Tony Kelly being kept scoreless, you know, for the first time in a long time, two weeks ago. Um, and it's happened again, you know, yeah. which is which is very, very strange. Is that, like, is that a bit of a worry? Is that a bit of a worry going into the Munster Championship? Probably had to say it's a small bit of a worry that he's not lighting it up, maybe, but I'm sure he'd be ready to light it up when he needs to. Like, it depends on how much of this is a phony war. So, like, fair enough, like, you, you go to some of the match reports and, like, so I'm looking at one in, in the Indo about this match and it's called a phony war. And, you know, you'll see this about lots of games, but it can't be the plan that Tony Kelly, for his own confidence, like, no player out there is happy to go through talent matches where they're not scoring. They want no. to get the score sheet, feeling good about themselves, getting on the ball, all that kind of stuff. If Tony Kelly's getting on the ball, he is going to get on the score sheet. So it, it would suggest that he's not getting on the on the ball that much or he's getting on it in the wrong parts of the field, which will bring us to Desi Hutchinson a little bit later on. Maybe Stephen Bennett, who, of course, hasn't been uh, available for every game. But, like, he didn't he went through the entire league without scoring from play. I mean, these things are little worries going into the championship. And like, last year, Tipperary put Seamus Kendi on, um, on Tony Kelly. And Tipperary were poor for a lot of that game, especially in the first half. But Kendi, when Tipperary were poor, very much came out on top on that battle. And maybe he won't be on him this year. Maybe he will. But I think Tipperary would be like, good, good. Glad to see that he's not firing at the moment. Well, I don't think, you know from playing and you know from being involved in the sideline as well, you can't just turn it on with a team. That's why I don't buy this idea of, uh, you know, we're holding something back or completely different tactics or anything like that. Because, you know, or playing somebody in one position i.e. Desi Hutchinson, for example, and then all of a sudden he's going to go into the inside forward line and he's going to light it up. Um, like, you have to be you have to be playing in that position. It's just that bit of familiarity. And I know we'll say on Desi, he's played in that position all his life. But you can't just... I, I just don't think it works like that, to be honest with you. I don't think you can flick a switch and everything's going to be, you know, completely different come championship. I think, from a t Tony Kelly's point of view, I think personally and collectively, they'd probably like if he was, you know, hitting two or three points and lighting it up a bit more than he is. Now, a player like him, I think you would trust the fact that he's going to be 100% right come summer uh, or come, you know, I hate actually that now that you can't say it really come summer anymore because it's the end of April and start of May or whatever. But um, you, you would trust a player like that, that he's going to have himself absolutely hopping off the sod. But I don't buy the argument of, Oh, you know, we're being cute, or we're doing. Do you know what I, mean? I just don't. I just. I, I. don't think that's reality, to be honest. Like, if you're in your first year as manager, are you going to play a lad out of position throughout the league just to to like hoodwink some teams come championship, and therefore not have a clue yourself how it's going to operate? For, you know, when you get to the championship matches. Not in a month of Sundays would you do that. No way. If you were playing, you know, and there's not a lot of video footage available, if you're over a club team and you're playing someone in a league game and you think you have a weapon with, say, a mass destruction that can really hurt a full-back or a cornerback, you might play him out wing forward or centre forward or something like that. And maybe, like the one I said to you about Izaki and, and Parik Matter, that you might mm. just let, let them get too familiar with them. But that's like one game. You're not going to do it the whole way throughout the league, you know? Do you see um do you see um David Fitzgerald getting off with this red card? Like we're 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 expecting an appeal at this stage. I'll just bring it up on screen here for anyone who hasn't seen it. But this will be Buff Egan's uh, footage. Tony Fitzgerald, two big men. Two, two big balls. Okay, so we're just pushing his dragon. No, it's a little bit untoward, but I don't expect well John, how, do you go, how do you get off? How like how do you show how do you show like he did make contact with him yeah he did so how do you I I'm just wondering how do you get off if you get me yeah yeah do you know what in my head I was thinking oh come on there's very little in that like Owen Downey's fine they're all fine but it's probably the the law is there for the one day that it's not fine so you're just not supposed to strike the head go all the way back to 2014 when the rule first came in wasn't a Podge Collins missed the replay between Wexford and Clare because he touched the face guard of a player in the drawn match 
so you probably won't get off of it, even though there's nothing in it. But just if you do want to enforce the rules, you know, and kind of tell people it's not okay to, to interfere with the face guard, etc., you probably can't get off. Well, it wasn't like the Rory Hayes and Peter Duggan thing last year was like, you know, that was a technicality or whatever. Like that was, by all accounts, or it was, you know, it wasn't done properly off Gwail guard. There was some sort of a loophole that they were able to get out through. Whereas um, Congress introduced rules now as well where you can't appeal and get off on something that's kind of is subjective the word or something very small that you know is basically meaningless and you're basically you know getting out through a, a loophole that shouldn't be there so i'm not sure like i'm not saying that listen that is a red card by the letter of the law you don't like to see a lad sent off and even tip tip will probably be happy that he's not playing but you'd be ha- you'd be happier if they had their their best team in another way too from a neutral's perspective oh God, no. yeah but i'm not sure how i'm just not sure how he gets off you know i'm just not sure how he, i don't know like, it's not as if they have a video that can show that he didn't do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't want to see, I want to see all the best sides playing, but I'm just not sure how we would get off, to be honest. Yeah, we nearly need a comment in here from Adrian McGrath to give us that uh, Claire side of things, or maybe Derek Lynch of Claire FM, if he's watching, give us your thoughts on it. Like, I totally agree. There's very little in it, but it's just hard to see him getting off on that basis. Positive side of things, Aidan McCarthy won 11 here. So nine of those are frees, but one, two again. Like, after missing last season, the man is fairly well on fire. Yeah, and like if, if you if you can have a forward line or a midfield up where Aidan McCarthy's flying, Tony Kelly's flying, Peter Duggan is flying, David Fitzgerald is flying, if available, like Claire are going to rack up big scores. There's no point in saying any different. And, and you've got your, your, your Ian Galvins, your David Reedies. You know, they have yeah. an awful lot of good players. Yeah, I actually get it now at this stage. If that was a Clare fella, he would have gone down to support reporter. You're obviously, referencing last year's Monster Clash when Road Hegarty sort of I don't know, pushed out a little bit on Aaron Fitzgerald and he went down and, you know, it was obviously uh, not the greatest spectacle, but that's obviously what that's about. So late on in the game, Clare were behind. I think McCarthy had scored three frees in a row and then Conor Cahalan and Conor Lahan, they got a, a point each to share the spoils. And it means that Cork remain unbeaten for, beaten for the champ, or for the league. And think of it this way, they came back to do what they did against Wexford, picking up a victory in injury time. They came back to beat Limerick, albeit Limerick were running the bench. They've come back here late on as well. They're starting to show that as the game is kind of closing out, they have the mentality to stay going. League or no league, I think that's a, a very good quality for Cork to have. Well, it's probably not something that we would have seen too much in, in recent years. So it's definitely a plus. And as one of the viewers said there, there's an awful lot of new players. I think they did they finish the game yesterday with three guys that had played in the All-Ireland quarterfinal last year against Galway or three guys that had started against Galway there's an awful lot of new faces in there um, even I think that was it was Rob Downey I think that uh, that David Fitzgerald made contact with I think he was actually out centre back yesterday I think you it was Rob Downey no, I thought I thought it was Rob because he was named at he was named at six. I only got to see the the highlights of the game. I thought it, I thought it was Rob. Maybe maybe it was one. I thought it was Rob. Um, and in fairness, he, yeah, as you say, there he he di- he didn't go down. And there's something else I've noticed in other games recently as well. Like there's certain players that are literally running into a tackle and raising their arms like this, just looking for a free. Definitely saw. It three or four times in the in the water for a Kilkenny game yesterday. Um it was it's it was pr- ridiculous, partic- isn't it? Yeah, it was particularly pointed, I thought, in that game. And the only way that's gonna stop now is if the referee you know when the player generally stops and they're just like looking for a free is if the referee blows them for over carrying yeah. or blow, blows a free the other way. Because um yeah I, I thought it was mad. There's, there's certain players in particular who are actually in space getting the ball and they're actually running into lads and like as a defender or as an attacker or whatever you're doing whoever's the defending player in that scenario it's very very difficult when the lad is just running into you like that so i if i was a referee i'd nearly be starting to call foul on those type of players but back to your point on cork again you're kind of you're loath to say that you've learned too much about them. You, we don't really know yet. The league was good last year. They beat Kilkenny in the semi-final. Came up well short against Watford. And then, you know, it was a bit of a stop-start Munster campaign. But, yeah, they can only do what they've done so far. There are definitely signs that the wheel is turning. Yeah, you're right. It was Rob Downey. Owen wasn't in the squad yesterday. Pao K says that John Den- Donnelly is the best at that. I presume that's putting the arms up going into into contact. Oh, I would have uh, said there was. I would have said there was a better player on the field yesterday than John Donnelly had. Now, to be honest, yeah, with you. There's, a few, <laughs> there's a few across the board. Darla Hans says met a fella at Mass and he told me that Cork hurlers were very bad. 
were top of the league, would crib over anything. And Porter Porter. Hey, man, says, that's some story, man. Fella, man. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to, to hear more about that. But uh, some of the other players that kind of stood out for Clare, of course, John Conlon. Uh, we know how important he is. Aidan McCarthy, we've already mentioned. Connor Cleary was very good. For Cork, then Brian Roach, he continues to impress. Harnady, he started this match. Brian Hayes was also very good. Alan Cadigan started. Didn't really happen for him so much. Uh, Parik Power, he got another game as well. He looks like he's going to be a very good player. He got 1-1. And after doing it against Wexford, like the options are building, like one of our commenters earlier said, seven players under 22 in this uh, in this team for Cork. Like Pat Ryan's very much doing it his own way, isn't he? He definitely is. Well, if you look at players that weren't really, there weren't options to them last year, uh, Parik Power, Brian Hayes, Ben Cunningham, Declan Dalton, who wasn't in the squad last year, there's four alone in the forward line. Not to mention Owen Downey, uh, Roach. Brian Roach, and a couple of more. Like there are a lot Tumi. of new, yeah, there are a lot of new faces in there. Um, all of whom have impressed to varying degrees. Yeah, Shame So Well says King Kenny does the old larkin trick. All right, arms up and stop and stops moving. And Patrick Coleman. Last year's league was affected by two teams. Limerick started slowly and were trying to win games, and Watford uh, doing what Watford do, collapsing. Wow, Patrick Coleman is going in heavy today, isn't he? Keep it coming, Patrick. We love to see those passionate comments. Catnap, Cork will need the options as the injury list is scary. But it's also scary for other teams. I mean, Darry Egan, he mentioned that we'll come to it. Cork, like you said there. Tipperary have plenty. Watford have plenty. It's, it's definitely an issue across the board. Um, Galway, and you've already mentioned Davy Burke pulling out for the, the season now, obviously, with the crucial injury. A 427 to 112 victory at Cusick Park against Westmead. I, look, it was, it was a, bit, a bit of a beat down here. Evan Nyland, he scored 11. Connor Cooney with five. Uh, plenty of other lads with one. One, Brian Concannon, Declan McLaughlin, and Jason Flynn. Uh, Tiernan Colleen, he got the other goal on the Westmead side of things. Kieran Doyle scored 1-4. Niall O'Brien scored five points. Uh, Davy Davy Glennon was the o- the only one of the two brothers to hold up his end of the bargain and get a point because Ronan Glennon, who was playing for Galway, didn't. But um, like you had said beforehand, very f- few times have brothers played against each other at intercounty level. No, very few, and it would have happened last year. Um, I think only Ronan was injured for the start of around the Leinster Championship when they played. Just first things first on the result, like. Galway just Galway have never had any problems with Westmead for whatever reason over the last couple of years, whereas maybe a team like Wexford have had a good few kind of problems with them, but they've always been pretty clinical. Um, from the Glennon's point of view, it's not something that happens too often. Uh, you you see maybe you know club mates or from native clubs maybe facing off against each other if they went in different directions, playing for different counties, particularly. I've was, seen a few times brothers playing against each other. Okay. So Kieran and John Hederson for Craig Kieran and uh, St. Vincent's in Dublin. That's right, yeah. And then also Brian Hogan and Keith Hogan playing against each other for O'Loughlin's <laughs> and Clara, and they were actually marking each other, weren't they? Yeah, they were marking each other in the county final. I actually interviewed the two of them and got a picture of the two of them, um, you know, in the week leading up to the final. That was a mad one. Um, and the two Rays, Shane, as well, that 1973 yeah. All-Ireland and final. Yeah, it, uh, you know, one was in Limerick, one was in London. Um, they're both obviously Limerick natives, but that that was that's a that's a mad one, and it's something that all they always, uh, you know, historians always go back to when this sort sort of thing happens with the Glennons. But I'd be fascinated to hear if our viewers have any have any other ones, maybe t- down towards lower tiers or somebody with playing with New York or London or maybe a Warwickshire or a Lancashire or something like that going back down their own county. Maybe there might have been a couple of them. Yeah, Mossy Carroll uh, played right. against his brother for Limerick, of course, as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so Galway had a big, big victory there. Just in terms of the table, Cork are top of that uh, that side of things in the, in Group One A. They're on nine points. Limerick eight. Limerick or Galway are on six. Clare five. Wexford are on two, and Westmead are bottom. Um, so we'll go over to the or we sorry we'll finish up with Lick, Limerick's victory over Wexford, two twenty to fifteen points. I mean that was a, a fairly comprehensive victory for a finish you might go through what Dar Egan had to say yeah very comprehensive I think Dar Egan's kind of by the sounds of it he's just happy to have seen the finish line of the league and get a, maybe a good block of work in with what he has and try and uh, 
rehabilitate the many many players that he has like he's a he's it's a fairly frightening injury list but he just said Darren Egan said he insisted the 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 break is absolutely ideal for us so they're not playing until April 22nd against Galway because we took the field today without nine of the team that played last year's quarter final against Clare we've 11 lads injured at present some of them are in a massive race against time so if we had another knockout game next weekend we could be just trying to plug holes um, and he's just talking about uh, Matt Johanlon has a very significant ankle injury. Liam Og McGovern has a knee injury. Conor McDonald has a calf strain. Damien Reck has a hamstring injury. Damien O'Keefe has a bad dead leg. And Liam Ryan hasn't played since he severed a ligament at the top of his finger against Galway on February 4th. He's definitely going to be under pressure to make the Galway game. That sounds very painful and very, very messy. Um, so, like, there's, there's not really much you can do with that. Do you know what I mean? If if you're, you know, severing ligaments is pretty serious and you're looking at, uh, you're looking at real long-term damage if you are to play with something like that and obviously the pain associated with trying to play with something like that. But, you know, I'd say if we can get Damien Reck back, McDonald back, Dio Keith back, McGovern back, at least that will bolster the rank somewhat. Doesn't sound like Macho Macho Hanlon will make the first round and it's said Ian Ryan to be under pressure too. And like they scored just five points from play. That doesn't augur well for the championship, does it? No, definitely not. And listen, that that's been the struggle, even with even with Lee Chin on the field. Um you know, they've struggled to, to find, you know, a lot of scores. And Gene Carty came through from defence and scored two points yesterday. Um, but they're, they're not going to put up big totals. It doesn't look like they're going to put big totals. If you take away, would say, even the... Did they end up with three goals against uh, Clare in that quarter final last year? Take those goals out. You know, it's... They're not the, the 223s and 224s that the limericks of these world will score in big knockout games. It doesn't look like they're going to be able to get, get up to that those type of tallies. Yeah, Lee Chin scored 11 points. 10 of those were free. Ian Carty with a couple. Connor Hearn and Jack O'Connor, they also got a point each. Pow Case says, Wexford only a handful of scores for play. Can't see coming from them this year. Wexford at damage limitation yesterday, says P. Well, 74. Uh, certainly give us more detail in terms of your, your thoughts on it, lads, if you were at that match. And it, it doesn't get easy for them in terms of their first match. So it's a month away. Um, April 22nd, Galway against Wexford at Pierce Stadium. So they've to cross the country. Big fixture. There's going to be a big home crowd there behind Henry Shefflin and his team. Jeez, they would have liked a slightly, I suppose, more winnable game You know, at the start of the championship. It's not that they can't beat Galway, but God, you need everyone, don't you? It's a fair trek when you say it, isn't it? From the, you know, the southeast of the country all the way over to the west and going over right onto the coast as well. It is a fair trek. Obviously, Galway made the same trek last year to go down and play in Wexford. Uh, but that kind of draw last year against Galway, not that it set Wexford up because they obviously drew Westmead in the middle of it as well, but it was probably a bit of a surprise result um, having bounced back from... Listen, right? They can see the five goals against Waterford in that semi-final last year and bounce back pretty well, you'd have to say, by getting that draw against Galway. And then they were, you know, they drew Westmead and you're thinking, like, it doesn't look like they have much of a chance going down to Nolan Park mm. here and to get a massive result. So they've bounced back from adversity really well, not just in recent years, but under the current manager that they have. So you'd probably be foolish enough to say that they, that they wouldn't do it again. Can they have a big impact on the latter stages of the All-Ireland? Very, very unlikely, though. Yeah, they have a lovely slick jersey though at orgoretro.com. So uh, go there and you can get 15% off with the promo code our game. Uh, it was notable that Kyle Hayes barnstormed up from wing back to score a goal yet again. And like that's, I'm interested to see next weekend who do Tipperary put on that wing? Now, the team won't be as left wide open at the back uh, this time, and there's probably more energy in the team these days. But he's somebody who you can't allow to make those Jack McCaffrey type bursts that can really put your team on the back foot. Um, but again, he's doing it. Teams need to plan for him. I suppose Michael Breen was put there a couple of years ago, and other than that one time when Breen wasn't in the in the, in the locality for that brilliant goal, he did a great job in him. So it shows that perhaps it can be done if you can find the right marker. Maybe Seamus Kennedy might be somebody who'd be put in that neck of the woods. He's very, very fast and athletic. But uh, that will definitely be a feature I'll be looking at for next weekend. Ah, oh, definitely. Um, he was obviously back from suspension. Carl O'Neill was brilliant for that goal. He went that went down the left flank, flicked a lovely ball across, and whatever chance he had of stopping Hayes, he was in full flow when he picked up the ball. You have no chance of stopping him. If you're going to stop him, it's probably in that first couple of yards before he builds up ahead of steam. Uh, and it will be interesting. Uh, Kennedy, uh, you know, physicality wise, he probably maybe wouldn't have the same. 
bulk as Hayes, but a very, very athletic player. And I think crucially for that type of a role, he's used to playing a defensive role, you know, mm. and he's going to be a defensive forward. Um, so that's he's probably the most likely. Would Alan would Alan Tynan do a stint on him maybe as well? Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, but you definitely, it's amazing, like, you're talking about planning for Galan or planning for Keane Lynch or planning for X, Y, or Z. You do have to plan for the two opposing. You have to plan for the whole half-back line, really. Because Burns had hurt you from distance. He actually got forward to score a point off his weaker side yesterday, which I hadn't hadn't seen, not from distance. Then you have to you have Hannon, how he can control things. And then you have Hayes, how he can just raid forward. So, yeah, I'd imagine there'd be a fair bit of talk put into it. And that, listen, Cal put a lot of thought into it when he was at Waterford as well. Remember he played Prunty out wing back last year on Garode Hegarty. Hegarty yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and even near the daily was doing well on Galan before he had to go off. So he's not averse to trying something different. I would say Jack Fagan going back wing back was with the sole idea of tracking Morrissey or Hegarty. And I, and I wouldn't say I'm that far wrong on that. So no. it'd be interesting to see what does Cattle try something a little different or does he and then maybe he's think, I'd say he's probably thinking with Seamus Kennedy he's probably thinking long term this fella can offer me a fair bit going forward but he can offer me a lot going back as well Daryl Hans says Lee Chin is in the top three hurlers in Leinster let, let, let's think who are the top hurlers in Leinster and viewers get your comments in because we'd love to hear from you so go through it um, so Kenny obviously have TJ Reid um, Adrian Owen Merlin Murphy. Owen Cody is in there as well I, w- I would put in that conversation now as well um, who do Galway have that you'd put in that conversation? Connor Whelan, without doubt. Like, if we're, Do- if we're going Donnie to Burke to, as a defender, yeah, if we were to limit to this to just a very, very short list, probably those two. Uh, do Wexford have anyone else? Rory O'Connor, potentially, when he's fully fit, yeah. We do, unfortunately, we haven't, we wouldn't have seen enough of it in, in recent years, but like, Lindsay, there, yeah. there's that, but there's that potential to be there. I probably think Chin is underrated in a way. You know, he always he always delivers and he's not delivering with, you know, a marquee team. Um I remember remember he went in full forward against against Clare last year and he was just a wrecking ball. And it looked like it was literally just a case of game plan out the window. Get like if you have to just get the ball into him and he will do something. Remember that performance against Kilkenny in twenty seventeen, where again he was like a wrecking ball out around the middle of the pitch. Um <sighs> Yeah, I, I I wouldn't be. Yeah, I probably have him. He probably wouldn't be number one for me, but he'd be in or around the top three, definitely. Yeah, Donald Burke would be another one from Dublin who just consistently delivers, particularly on the scoreboard. At the other end of the field, they probably have Owen O'Donnell in the mix as well. Yeah, for me now, I'd say it'd probably be TJ, Adrian Mullen, Lee Chin. That would be my order. I think Owen Cody's really. No, well, on a second now. So you're leaving Connor Wheel now, your top three. Oh, God. No, you're not. You're not. No, I just, sorry. I had because you're always. You, you, you can't. You can't leave TJ out, even though he's. You know, he's he's getting older and older. He's still producing. Um, I think Adrian Mullins just class. So and yeah, kind of. Geez, do you know what? This is tough. I, I'd probably have Chin just on the periphery. That probably would be my top three. It'd be TJ Mullen and probably Connor Whelan. I'd say yeah. And, yeah. And, like if those are the three players that are coming ahead of you. That's it's no mean feat either, but he's he's definitely in around the tree without a doubt. Yeah, and that's before we get talking about the monster lads, huh? Uh, well, the question was about Leinster, so we keep it the Leinster. <laughs> Patrick Coleman says Wexford are like the British Army after Battle of uh, Somme with all the injuries. Jeez, it's not exactly like would like Patrick, but fair enough. <laughs> Up the entrance from Westmead see Dublin as the target game. Is Wexford a target game for them in Leinster this year? Well, if the injuries stick up to Grodo Gracon, it may well be. Uh, Shane O says, interesting how Wexford had Rory O'Connor wingback was mainly just sitting deep defending space for Galan Flanagan to move into. So maybe I suppose with all the injuries, he was deep, more deeper lying because they can rely on him on the ball. And they also think that if he gets on it, he can carry it out at pace and do a little bit of damage. So you can always see logic to these types of things, but I would imagine best case scenario, everyone available. That's not really what Dara Egan's going to be looking to do. I wouldn't think so. And that might be what one of the previous viewers said who's actually seen the whole game and we haven't about talking about damage limitation. Like I, I you know, I've been involved, I remember being involved in a school team one time where we had like probably 13 players. Like we had 15 obviously, but we had 13 realistically. So, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, just been, just, just been honest. I'm not going to name, name what team it was or anything like that, but we went down to play 
oh, I'm going to say it was Kilkenny CBS in a game. And it was literally, it was the sort of game where we were going to win by scoring 2-9 or 2-10 back, back in the day. So we, sta- we stacked our defence. Um, we had a really strong 1-9. to nine. Most of our best players 1-9. Uh, good, a good centre forward and a really good inside forward who had to do a hell of a lot of work by himself. But you know what I mean? Like you're, you're trying to like we could have uh, we could have had a way stronger forward line, stronger midfield, a weaker defence, and been beaten by fifteen points. Are you, you know what I mean? I I like I've no issue with with Dar Egan doing that because you have to kind of box clever as well. He probably they could have been beaten maybe twenty points had he you know organised the team a bit differently or whatever. So I've I've no I've no issue with that. You have to kind of play what you have on the given day and try and spread it out as best you can to. Yeah, to try and keep yourself in the game, give yourself a chance, and I suppose not to make sure that you know any confidence isn't sapped out of you as well. Well, it was not the big thing for Brian Cody in his last few years over Kilkenny. Like initially, it's it almost seemed like he had an embarrassment of riches. No matter what team he picked, it was going to go out and do the business. And then in the more recent years, you know, during the seven years where he didn't win the All Ireland, at the end, he had to sort of do what most managers have to do around the country, which is. How can I jig this thing together so it's the best case scenario of what we can produce? And you might have lads on the sideline going, just why is he playing in that position? And you're like, well, you know, if, if I put him up there or in that position, we're going to be totally exposed elsewhere. So, yeah, most managers have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Even, I'm just thinking of Chris Crummy. He had to move up because Dublin, well, so they had to do something with the attack. I'll put it to you that way. They yeah. needed some sort of a different player. You would still take him on your best defensive players away, but... Matty Kenny obviously taught and they got fair fruits out of it at different stages. But like Luke and even even Luke and the club team had to do that at times as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Um I must even thinking of, of uh the late the late great Dylan Quirk as well. Like he uh, I think John O'Keefe said it after that he didn't particularly like playing the forward line, but he knew like John O'Keefe said, I know I know he was the natural centre back, but we needed him up there. And one of the reasons they won the county final a couple of years ago was because of what he was able to offer in attack. Whereas John O'Keefe kind of openly admitted that he couldn't offer the same thing in attack. So they had to kind of move their pieces around to suit them best. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Coleman gives his top three. Mullen, TJ, Chin. Uh, Seamus O.L. says Mullen, TJ, Whelan. And Seamus O.L. adds that Mullen is massively important to how can Kenny play. The Mannions of Galway, of course, says Por- uh, Porter Porter. Yeah, very true point as well. We didn't really consider them just uh, because Porrick Mannion has been such a leader for that team over the last number brilliant, of years. Yeah, brilliant, Would you brilliant. put him in the hurdler of the year conversation in both 17 and 18 in the conversation anyway? Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, yeah. Without a doubt. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next uh, game to talk about then. Actually, do you know what? We're going to play a little video from one of the coaching clinics that we had in recent days. So just give me a moment here and I'll get it ready. So this was Pat Ryan. He's talking about the origin of that goal that Grode Hegarty got in the All-Ireland final last year. You know the one that he put into the top corner, into the side netting. And it turns out that Limerick do actually practice, before training, some of the forwards will practice on putting the ball into the, actually into the side netting. This is just for practice here, for a bit of fun, and obviously getting that bit much sharper, right? But the entire back net, if we hit it, you just get, you get zero, okay? If it goes over the bar, you get zero. If it goes wide, you're minus one, right? So what we do is we get maybe four balls each, two off both sides, like a penalty shootout, whoever wins, goes to sudden death, it's 4-4, four, four. okay? Right, so I'm up first here, right? just, uh, just 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes for training if you get down early. Grab four or five balls, go with another fella, you know what I mean? And do something like this. And t- I tell, I'm sure you know, it will add up by the end of the year, right? So, it's just simple, you move through it, right? That's one. I'll shade you up now. I'll give you that, the back post, yeah, I'll give you that. No, yeah, no. See, you see, you're on zero now, boys, get me. Yeah, hold up there, Steph. What's your name, Jenna? Evan, if you... The way you ran there, right? Great, great. Not that it's all here. If you haven't time for a split second to look up or get set, and you actually haven't time to shoot, you say, you came with great pace then, oh, it's not wrong with that. You just hit it straight away. If you haven't time to get that quick, that quick plan, just that one split second, take it in another bit. You know what I mean? Right, next up. Yeah, take it on. Use your steps, yeah? Yeah, that's one. Move it in a bit further. Put the balls in here, boys. Yes. Get 
take three steps away, right? Yeah, move it. Boys, don't pick up these balls. Move, move through these balls in here. You want to be striking them. Yeah. Any top, top goal is going to score. 21. You want to be striking just at the 13 minutes. Well done. That was a nice one. Ooh. Don't see anyone going at the same side twice. Minus one. What had you already for that? You had what? I won for that. You're on that? No. <laughs> well done. Anyone has two? Well done. You two, don't you? No, I have one. Well done. Minus one. Hold up. Yeah. So, did everyone get two shots? You got three, I think. Yeah. What you finish on? Uh, I don't want to say that was minus one. Anyone get two? Hands up. Dead. Plus one? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you have a winner there. It's a bit of crack. Like, do you know what I mean? We'd be at training. Like, there'd be fierce banter there. Like, do you know what I mean? You'd be 10, 15 minutes before training. You'd be mad to get out and do it. But, like that, then you could say two or three of us got together, right? She's like, what's over the bar? Zero or minus one? Huh? Is over the bar? Zero or minus one? Zero. Oh, no good here in this game, you know what I mean? Again, and like I said to any of the coaches, if they're a bit younger, do you know what I mean? I know how to sign it, and you know, it's going to be tough to get scores and that. Just put even, I have the yellow cones there, that would be a score. Put even a longer pole up, because it's even kind of easier, kind of, you know, to start with it. So, uh, other, no, other than that now, guys, do you know, have you any questions on that one? Like, do you know what I mean? Shane was talking to me about uh, Goat Hegarty's goal last year. Where did it end up? I don't know if you remember it, everyone was talking about it. Yeah. Right into the sign it. He done it, I'd say, the 10 months, I'd say 100 times a month. Over that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, I mean, he gave an exhibition there, didn't he? The, the way his example of doing it at the start, he just pinged it, and it made that lovely, satisfying sound hitting the net. Different the noise, isn't it? Like, I, yeah. it's not, I don't know it's something I thought about too much before, but it is a different sound completely when it goes into the side netting because the, the back netting is so kind of taut, isn't it, generally, mm. that it just goes in. Whereas you're going off the side netting, there's, lo it's, there's no better sound than the back stanchion. When you hit the back mm. stanchion, it goes into the net. I think a lot of the... Hey, we'd know all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of the... By accident, maybe. A lot of the pro soccer players, particularly when they're taking penalties, they're aiming for that back stanchion uh, because you're giving yourself... Again, the margin of error is not that big, maybe with Hegarty's shot, with these shots. But if you get it in there, it's literally unstoppable. Um, And it's just... Yeah, I, I, I chatted to a few different Limerick lads before about the, the kind of the play that they do before training. And they do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um and yeah, little things that might make a difference, you know, on some of the biggest days of the year. And that that particular drill definitely didn't last year's all Ireland final with Hegarty anyway. Yeah, we've a full fifty minute video of Michael Fenley up on patreon.com forward slash our game. We've an extended one of Brick Walsh as well. I think it's about forty minutes, and then there's gonna be more of Pat Ryan on Patreon as well. Uh Richard Hogan gives his top three in Leinster Mullen TJ own Cody so he's gone full key Kenny mode there no surprise TV Street says yourself and Vernie should do this game and make a video of it I'll do it no problem I Can see it? no reason why we wouldn't you, <laughs> you know I, don't know, I don't know how many it'll hit the side then but <laughs> yeah do you think we, that pleasing sound that's not going to be happening that swish off the net the only thing I'd say is if we when if and when we do do it um, you have to go kind of not. You have to go kind of full bore with the shot. Obviously, there's no tipping and tapping. Like you're not. If, if it hits the back of the side net and then it rolls in or any crack like that, that's obviously not allowed. Yeah. So I mean, we could try and blast it and miss hit it, or we could try and hopefully guide it into the car. Would you be more comfortable shooting off your left or right hand side? Left, actually. Funnily enough, yeah. But if you were to drive the ball a hundred yards, left or right? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be the same. If you were given, I put it to you this way, if you had, your life was on a 20, 20 yard pass on the run, it'd be off my left all day, every day. Yeah. Yeah. Without doubt. Without doubt. I'd be the same. Right. So Tipperary had a fairly comfortable victory against Antrim, 428 to 216 up in Corrigan Park. Tipperary scored 15 goals in five league games. You have to obviously put the caveat in that it is the weaker side of the league. There's no question about it. There's more winnable games there. So Tipperary have finished top of Division 1 Group B on 10 points, a scoring differential of plus 59, which is the best across the two top divisions. Kilkenny next on 8 points. Watford and Dublin, they finished on 5, which was 2 wins a draw and 2 losses each. Antrim with 2 because they won the crucial game against Leash. And then Leash uh, finished bottom of the table there. But Tipperary 5 from 5, 
Uh, the, the players scoring the goals here were uh, Sean Ryan, he got 1-3. Mark Kyo, Connor Bowe, they both got a goal, and so did Podge Campion. So there was a lot of different scores for Tipperary here. Gerard O'Connor staying on the freeze. I presume he's going to be on them for the championship now. I'd say so, yeah. Um, but, well, maybe Jason Ford will be, actually, if they're both out on the field. But um, that, that's that's impressive from Tipperary because some people were talking about this could be a tricky one for Tipperary. And I was more like, I think Tipperary are going to go out and produce the same stuff again. I didn't expect to win by quite this much. And Antrim, you know, they're obviously trying things out at this stage because they had their win in the big one. But that's that's impressive stuff for Tipperary to put up that sort of a score. Yeah, uh, one thing that definitely stands out is John McGrath, seven points, one free, six from play. Um, good sign that he's kind of coming back to himself as well. And another, he's a different type of option. You In a forward line, you want different types of players, different types of options. He offers something different, be it in the half line or in the inside line as well. The goal he set up for Conor Bowe the last day where he drew a man, drew two men in. Sorry, was that for Jake Morris? Yeah, J Jake Morris's third one. And drew two men in and popped it into Morris in space. Like, it was brilliant. Maybe the defender shouldn't have bought it, but, you know, he's the sort of player who you're not surprised if he does it. No, no. And it just, it's good to see him coming back. Um... Uh, I don't think the Bonner I'm not sure if the Bonner played but the Bonner it looks like he's back to form again like I, I think he's in, like he's in a good form in the last couple of games as he's been in in the last five years I'd say and yeah he's he didn't play different again he, like he off, just as well just that kind of the worker be in around there but he's getting on the scoreboard now and he's probably maybe even setting up even more scores than he has in, in recent years but there's a lot of signs of like I'm putting it to you this way there's very few lads not in form there's a lot of lads showing really, really good form, and that's a really good sign of whatever they're doing during the week, and they're bringing it to the match, uh, bringing it to match days at the weekend. Yeah, so for Antrim, Conal Cunning, he scored five points, one of those from play. Nigel Elliott scored one, two. Rian McMullen scored one, one. Michael Bradley continued his uh, good form. He scored three, and a few other lads uh, pitched in with scores as well. Would you be overly concerned if you were Antrim at, you know, conceding this sort of a scoreline you know you think in the last couple of years against Clare and Wexford and so on they're putting up really strong performances even Kilkenny in the last couple of years they're not losing by all that much and Darren Gleeson is maybe a bit frustrated at moral victories or whatever whereas this is you know it's a heavy loss yeah no you would be disappointed and um, the two Tipperary games Tipperary last year when they conceded seven goals uh, and this game as well. You just on, on home soil and Corrigan Park has generally been a bit of a fortress for them. They've taken a lot of teams down the stretch. They took Kilkenny down the stretch there this year. They obviously beat Clare there. They beat Wexford there. Or they drew Wexford there. I, I, there there's definitely definitely going to be a bit of disappointment with it. Um they most of their big guns out by all accounts. You don't you can you can write it off or put a line through it, but it's still there and it still happened and it's still Puts it, you know, can allow a little bit of doubt to creep in. Um, like wh what you're thinking, kind of what's Antrim's goal come Leinster? Obviously, to to try and get a win over Westmead and to try and potentially upset somebody else. Realistically, probably a Wexford or a Dublin. So Paul O'Sullivan makes a good point here. Funny how Cork top Division One A and it's only the league, so obviously that's the stronger side. Tip top a much weaker group and tip her back. Beware the false dawn. Do you know, within that, I think it's because there's a lot of players that Tipperary have there that have either done it underage, and there's plenty of one in All-Ireland just in, in 2019. I, I think it's easier to make a case for Tipperary. Also, the manager has taken Watford to an All-Ireland final and so on. It's easier to sort of say that about Tip than about Cork with a lot of players that we haven't seen before. Young, It's very difficult to say, oh, all these lads coming through from under 20s can transfer to senior level straight away. I don't. I think that's maybe why people are, are looking at it in those terms. I'll tell you why they're looking at it in these terms. Tipperary finished bottom of Munster last year without a point. Do you know what I mean? They were nowhere. Cork got out of Munster, uh, hammered Tipperary along the way, and were, got to an All-Ireland quarter-final. Probably should have been in a semi-final. So you have a team that's starting from the lowest of bases. So anything, the only way it was up, and Tipperary have gone up. Whereas Cork, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be downplaying the fact that you know, they're, they're after topping their group. They did, they did the same last year and maybe didn't kick on as much. But the point is, is that Tipperary are coming from the lowest of bases. So, yeah, in comparison to last year, they definitely are back. Yeah, Darla Hans has always loved Shane's background. He's talking, I'd say, about that T-shirt back there that you can get at our store. Uh, a Cork sympathiser at heart, Fernie will have to step up his game. Kilkenny jersey here. Kilkenny jersey there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Richard Hogan asks, Mick, have Tipperary peaked too early? I wouldn't have thought so. 
I wouldn't have thought so. Um, You're a believer, I aren't you? No, I think I, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in Liam Cahill, I have to say. And I'd be totally writing off. Uh, I'd be totally writing off. I, I'd put it this way. I'd be putting Waterford's. I'd be putting some of Waterford's championship display. As, I'd be putting it as much in the squad as it would be on Cattle. I'd put it that day, that way, given what they produced in the two and a half years previous to that. I thought there'd be a bouncing tip when Cattle and Bevins came in, and there definitely has been. And uh, yeah, I think they'll be consistent this year. They, you, they, you know, there won't be lads walking through their defence like they were last year, and I think they'll be hitting the net fairly regular, as has been emphasised already. So yeah, no, I think I, I think there's a fair shot at them getting out of Munster. All right. Porter Porter asks, will Conor Bow start in the championship? Has he done enough? He's used an awful lot on the bench, but he's coming in and scored. He came on against Dublin, scored a goal. Came on against Waterford, scored a goal. Gets his chance here, scores a goal. I'm a huge, huge fan of Conor Bow, and I'd like to see him starting. But I actually don't know because it's so difficult to decide who, like, who's going to be the tip starting six forwards. I think Grodo O'Connor is going to start centre forward. I think Seamus Kennedy is going to, st- look, let's call a spade a spade. Seamus Kennedy spends a lot of his time uh, working in the middle third, the likes of Paddy Deegan, he's wearing number 12 and he's playing sweeper. There is Teams don't play with six forwards anymore, so let's call a spade a spade here. But of those jerseys that are traditionally considered the forward jerseys, which are 10 up to 15, Jake Morris is definitely going to start. Uh, Jason Ford, I'd imagine, is definitely going to start. Noel McGrath is captain, but I don't know, will he be midfielder in the forwards? I think Alan Tynan is going to start for sure. Um, have I, I've, who else will start? What do you think? Do you think Bonner will start? I think you have, think you have nearly six names, don't you? Yeah. Like, uh, like John McGrath, he's obviously now pushing a little bit. Mark Kyo, he's shown, like, he's shown a, a nice bit in his form to be in that conversation. And I feel like I'm definitely forgetting somebody obvious as well. If so Callum is back, obviously he'd be in the mix too. Um, if yeah. he's back, whether he will be or not, I'm, I'm not, not fully sure. But there's a decent balance to that forward line, in fairness. Um, next week, we'll tell a lot about Big time. It says one stop auto, and Darla Han says to Tallowman, who you know, Tallowman had just said that Cork need Brian, Ho- Brian Hogan. I'm not having that. We have the best centre back in the country, and he's 20. Talking about Kieran Joyce. Uh, before you select uh, Kennedy wing forward, what's the defence for Tipperary? Says Adrian McGrath. Again, you know, when you're trying to ask me to name a team off the top of my head when I'm focusing on a million different uh, things this morning, it's very difficult. <clears throat> but assuming that Cahill Barrett is back. He's going to play there. Michael Breen will be there. I would imagine that Brian O'Mara will definitely be there. Ronan Maher, assuming he's fit, he'll also uh, start. Johnny then Ryan, cornerback? Uh, Johnny Ryan could also be in there, yeah, of course, as well. Um, off the top of my head, it's very hard to remember because I don't have the full panel in front of me. Actually, I do have the, the match program from the game against Dublin there recently. Is there anyone that I'm forgetting that's pretty obvious? Is there anyone that uh, that you can think of? Uh, there's we're forgetting we're forgetting a wing back. I think um, I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, go on. <clears throat> uh, well, um, Connor McCarthy is another person that could be in the mix. Um, o- Owen Connolly is another end of Heffernan. I don't know. Actually, it's a it's a tough one. But like, I think Seamus Kennedy has even when he was named number seven against Watford, he was still playing the same role as the deep line in twelve, if you will. He wasn't man marking somebody at wing back. So I think like Dan McCormick has sometimes been used at wing back as well. He went back there to man mark Austin Gleason the last day up until Gleason got injured. Um Adrian McGrath then saying still need a wing back. Was Hannon controlling games at when he was twenty is what Daryl uh, Lahan is saying in terms of uh, I suppose Kieran Joyce, he's doing really, really well at his age. I suppose Hannon was up in the forward line. Yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of Joyce, I have to say. I think he's chatting. I've been chatting someone in Cork down at the Cork Limerick game in Parky Rin this year, and they were convinced that Ben O'Connor would be the long term centre back if he committed to, her, to the hurlers. But I don't know. I think I think Cork have their long term centre back in Joyce. Big, big fan of him. He makes, he makes, you know, what he does, he makes big plays in games as well really important times um i just think he's also goes into contact with the arms up he does a bit as well yeah um it's funny that keen kenny was mentioned as well he's definitely one of the biggest culprits for that i did, still didn't think he was i thought i think Carrick daly's very bad for it now i have to say i think he did it three or four times yesterday uh in that in that game and he's a lot of the time he's literally stopping keen kenny does the same they actually just stop and look for the free uh and they're the one 
they're the ones that are making the contact. They're the ones that are doing something to in, initiate it. Uh, and I definitely think it's something that needs to be clamped down. And I'm sure it's something that referees will be talking about going into the championship because we, you know, the last thing we want is that stopping the whole time and a free every time a fella runs into a fella, basically. Yeah, a uh, great result for Kildare at the weekend, says Fla. Sounded like a good battle in the second half at Offaly, which will come to... When it comes to... Uh, when it comes to it, will any of Tip and Cork beat Limerick? Have Tip any pace? Well, whether Tip have pace or not, there's definitely some in the forward line. Tip won't be leaving the back line as exposed. So the opposition shouldn't get as many opportunities to just run straight up through the gaps in the middle. When it comes to it, will any of them beat Limerick this year? No. Um, yeah. If, 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 if we're being honest, I don't think so. Yeah, uh, Talaman says Watford run into contact, stop, hand pass, repeat, and that game we'll come to the yeah. Look, we'll uh, just finish off on Dublin Leash before we come to Kilkenny against Watford. One twenty nine for Dublin, twenty points for Leash, and afterwards, Michal Dunne, who said the attitude and application of the players has been really good. The key word for us is consistency. To be consistent in everything we do, and to get more consi- uh, consistent performances every day we go out. Well, he consistently said the word consistent in that sentence anyway. <laughs> And he said, the league overall, it's been okay. Obviously, from my perspective, you want to win every game. And if you can't, that's disappointing. There was probably the good, the bad, and the ugly in it for us in different periods of the game. So, uh, look, I think it's good for Dublin, obviously, because they were beaten so comprehensively by Limerick, or sorry, by Kilkenny last week. But you wouldn't be getting blown away at the same time. Like, overall, their league, I think okay is probably about as good as you could say. This was a you know pretty handsome victory. Other than that... I mean, I, they just haven't blown me away, at, uh, you know, at this stage. No, same. I thought they were quite, you know, they were going, tipping along nicely before they went into that Kilkenny game. That was really disappointing. They probably, realistically, they did what we both expected uh, against Leash. There's a gas comment coming in there. Daryl Han asks, Taloman, uh, uh, where are you from, Taloman? And Taloman says, would you believe Talo? Um, I'm, ama- I'm amazed by that, actually. The the, the hint maybe should have should have been in the name. Uh, but from a Leash point of view, Leash are in that same position that, uh, that Westmead were in a couple of years ago where they're after having a fairly harrowing Division 1 campaign and now they're stepping back a tier for championship and it's a matter of have all those defeats and a potential relegation would that play that game against Westmead this weekend will they have had like a really negative effect or will it, will it be we've played against this quality of opposition we should be able to be you know, better than the quality of opposition we're playing, the the Killers, the, the Offleys of this world when they play Joe McDonough. Yeah, they've been exposed to that top level. And it's going to be tough. And, you know, that's a big challenge for Willie Maher and Dan Shanahan. Can they sort of rouse the troops and say, lads, it can't get any more difficult than what we've seen so far this year. Let's not let that all be for nothing. Let's go out now and, and show our best side in the Joe McDonough Cup versus the other teams who probably have a bit more confidence. Um, in terms of the least scores, Picky Maher got 11 free. Stephen Bergen, he got three. A few other lads pitched in with a little bit less than that. Donald Burke, he scored 10. Three of those from play. Alex Considine won three. Keen Boland and Dara Purcell, they scored three apiece. I'm interested to see Dara Purcell getting more game time there because we've, we've seen very little of him so far. Um, so he obviously is getting a bit of game time there. Now, Kilkenny against Watford. We've saved the worst for last, have we? Yeah, pro- pro- probably. Yeah, we've we've somehow managed to be an hour and ten minutes into the show and left the most consequential game of Division One until last. The only one that mattered. <laughs> it was putrid, wasn't it? Ah, uh, it was hard. It was very hard to look at. Yeah, very, very hard to look. Who at. Who do you blame? Yeah. Who do you blame? Do you blame the weather? Do you blame Derek Ling? Do you blame Davy Fitz? Do you blame the players? Do you blame the ref? Uh, I don't blame the ref. No, I wouldn't blame the ref. I think it was a lot to do with the way that Watford, in particular, set up. I would say um, it's almost like they were. You're happy. blaming Davy Fitz. Well, he's the manager, so yeah, we're, we're probably, he's probably the the chief culprit. I would say they kind of. It was like. Watford really, really packed, really packed their defence, particularly the day that was in it. You know, a team wasn't going to be able to hurt, you know, the other team from 100 yards or anything like that. So they let Kilkenny have the ball until a point and then press probably around the 65. Um, the ball going into the two sets of forwards was probably not hectic at different times, but there was always a surplus of defenders. Uh, was there a, Tom Barron had a goal chance that was 
probably the height of it, I'd say. And he should have hit the ground. He really should have hit the ground on a wet day. That went over. He had a good point chance at the end, I think, to bring them back level as well, which he would have been disappointed with. Yeah. Um, I just, I we need to get into an out I can't get over this, this the way they're deploying Desi Hutchinson. I think it's absolutely bonkers. I can't get my head around it. It makes no sense to me. Um, he's you know, a small enough kind of diminutive player out around the middle of the field. I think he's kind of half lost inside as an inside forward. I think he's dynamite. He's been an all star nominee the three years he's played inter county hurling. He's been an all star nominee. He's getting better and better. And you might just read out that hurler under the ditch had a couple of stats from De- from Desi Hutchinson's performance against Kilkenny. Yeah, he said he had 14 possessions, zero shots, eight uh, hand passes, five being sideways, three stick passes, one sideways. Dispossessed twice, freeze one was one, and freeze conceded was one. Possession location, none inside the 45 of the attacking half of the field, four between the 45 and 65, and between the 265, six, defensive half was four. So they're they're fairly damning statistics. If the whole idea of you know hurling is pack the middle, draw a load of lads back, and then deliver a nice ball to the inside line where your really dangerous forwards can do There is no inside line. And I mean, this is the problem, like even when we were talking about the tip game last week. At times he was over at the corner flag, at times he was in his own half of the field. And you're just wondering, like, fair enough, Kilkenny, you know, they're without Adrian Mullen, TJ Reid. There's a few players missing. But you could see what they were doing in terms of how often did they try to deliver that ball, especially diagonally to the right corner as we're looking at it on TV, in for, like, Massey Keown or, you know, whatever forward was in there. You could see the plan was to, to get the ball in there and get it to players who were up there. Whereas with Watford, you'd imagine half forwards coming through traffic, right? Sorry, half backs coming through traffic. And, you know, you've kind of beaten the man. And you're like, wow, there's more traffic here. I need to deliver this ball. I need an outlet. And they look up and there's nobody up there. Or too too frequently, there isn't anybody up there. I don't know. I don't think I'd love to be a player in the middle eight playing in that, in that system. If you, you know, if you were Watford manager and, you know, you had John Milan in your team, would you play him in the middle third? Hmm. No, do you know? I just I, I like it, I've not been smart with you, right? Me and you have, you know, not not not, you know, we have a bit of talent, okay? But we're not going to be playing in the inside forward line, right? But it, just say you're trying to make it make a role for, for forward, okay? No, okay, you're <laughs> not you're not a nippy corner forward. Just say you're trying to make a role for a lad as a bit of a link man or something like that. Like to me, Desi Hutchinson is playing the Paddy Levy role. But Desi Hutchinson is not Paddy Levy. Paddy Levy plays that role. He plays it to perfection. Desi Hutchinson is a killer inside. Like a is, killer. Is Davey selling, selling everyone a pop ah, at the moment? I don't, I, don't, I don't know, Shane. Like, do you play a lad out in a different position and then just move him into, move him into, into, into the inside forward line for championship and expect that he's going to hit the ground running hmm. straight away even though he hasn't played a competitive game in that position? I think because it's Davey, it's like... Oh, he's pulling the wool over her eyes, or he's playing, you know, silly beggars, as they say, over in England or whatever. But like, nah, I, 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 I think it's madness now. I have to say, I think it's, I think it's bonkers. I think it makes no sense. And I think, what do you? I think what's your job as manager? It's to utilize the players uh, that you have at your disposal and use, utilize their strengths best. If if Desi Hutchinson is a link man and a man out the middle of the pitch, then I don't know. I I can't get my head around it. Yeah. Well, look. So there are plenty of people commenting saying that they think that um, that won't be Desi's role when it comes to the championship. But I'm I'm trying to think of it. Put yourself in the situation. If you're a new manager coming into a team, he's been at Watford before, but basically this is a completely different team than, than what he's had before. So he's getting used to them all and all that kind of stuff. And you've got those five league games that you're guaranteed. Maybe you'll get playoff or knockout. Maybe you won't. But you've these five games where you're guaranteed to be able to trial out what you have, what you've been practicing and training. I don't think you'd go through the entirety of the league and not try out a player in a position where you're going to play him in the championship because you've so few opportunities. It's not like, you know, John Kiley could play, I don't know, um, Peter Casey cornerback for the first five games of the league. But because they've played it so many times over the course of the last five (laughs) or six years, he knows he can throw him back up corner forward, you know, or, you know, whatever his role is. So I just think it's unlikely that Desi will now revert back to the inside forward line. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me like this is the plan and they're going to live and die by it. If you were manager of an opposition team and you saw Desi Hutchinson out around the middle of the field, with due respect to Desi, you'd be laughing. 
You really would. You'd be thinking, like, he's not, he's just not going to hurt us from out there. Desi's got a really good strike for an inside forward, but his range is probably, like, I'd say 65 and in. He's not going to hurt you from out from out the pitch. Um, and, like, his, his, um, his size is brilliant for inside because he's pacey, he's dynamic, he's, you know, elusive, he's hard to... But out around that middle third, just going to have big lads run, big lads running into him the whole time. I don't think it makes any sense. Uh, maybe it'll change come championship, but signs would suggest that if that's what they've gone with for the entirety of the league, then that's what they're going to go with come championship. And I don't know, I don't think it's, like, you know what they say about, like, freshening them up, or giving them, you know, a different... I don't know, I don't know if this is freshening them up at all. I, to me, it looks like it's the role that they're going to play, uh, they're going to play for them. Put it this way, last year Waterford were disastrous in the championship and obviously I know they beat Tipperary, but like for what we were expecting, they were disastrous, and he still got nominated for an All Star because he's the best player by a mile, yeah, yeah. And he was doing it against the big teams, like he was brilliant against Limerick, for example, that day. Like you can't take him out of his best position. Maybe they'll put him back in. Do you know, we're not obviously we're not totally prejudging, but if this is the way, it just doesn't make sense. Porter Porter says uh, you have a bit of talent. This was your quote, not mine. Who's the better hurler? <laughs> <laughs> he's got Indra County. It's it's obviously him. Jesus, I didn't think he'd give it that easy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just don't think I'd have a leg to stand on here. Okay, fair enough. There's a, I'll take I'll take that. I was surprised at that. I was expecting a 10-minute debate, to be honest with Yeah, you. but to be fair, it's not much to write home about, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, so don't we'll, see, try... we'll see when we do the Pat Ryan skill challenge. Okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That'll, that'll be an interesting. So, like... We're talking there about, does this style suit Watford? It doesn't seem to suit Desi as things stand. Now, look, maybe things will change. Maybe he looks at him like, uh, if I can have him used to this role, and when it comes to summer and the ground hardens up and all this kind of stuff, that he can almost Tony Kelly things for me, you know, run everywhere. Maybe. Maybe that's the plan. We're not entirely sure. But does the overall game plan suit Watford? Did it suit Wexford? But do you think this suits Watford? I don't know. I think they're caught between two styles at the moment. Um, like I, Liam Cattle, Liam Cattle sides love to run. Okay, they do, and they, they tip are running a lot, but they also are, are not adverse to you know hitting a seventy yard ball into lovely bit of space. Whereas Wofford, it's just, to me, it's, a lot of it is just running and running and running and running. Um, and at times, you know. Remember that Stephen Bennett goal chance against, or it should, what should have been a goal chance against Tipperary? He looked to hand pass the ball to someone, as there would have been someone there in cattle time. There was nobody there. There was lads getting the ball out around the 65 yesterday and not able to shoot and looking to hit a ball inside, and there was nobody in there. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, if you have uh, Mikey Kiley, you know, if Mikey Kiley's going to be fit come summer, like, you have a big target, man. Like, I think Desi in around him in a two man inside line. Maybe potentially with Patrick Fitzgerald playing outside him or somebody else playing outside him. Like I just, I'm not sure if they're utilizing what they have at their disposal because they've a lot of really good players to use. And also, you're going into the championship now with. So this is like you know we're talking about managers being clever or whatever. Austin Gleeson will have not have played a competitive game, would have not have started a competitive game in 2023. Going into well, he the did against. He just came okay. off early. Okay, he will not have played more than uh, forty minutes in any game. I'd say. Oh, in, more than a half hour. More yeah, than a half hour. Yeah. In twenty twenty three, if Desi Hutchinson goes back inside, he would have, would have not played a competitive game inside for Watford in the championship. Mikey Kiley hasn't played. Probably won't have played maybe six to eight weeks by the time he's back. Same with Prunty. Um, I know John Milan said it in his column in the, the Independent on Saturday. There are a lot more questions than answers about Watford. Uh, and that was before last weekend. And I think there's probably even more after yesterday's game. OK, so let's talk about Kilkenny then. And, uh, and um, there were some good things in this match. The fact that they came behind um, to get the win is good. Obviously, they're kind of franking the form that they showed to some degree against Dublin. And it's helping banish the memory of, you know, of what happened against Tipperary. Um, in terms of the scorers in this match, Billy Drennan, he scored 10 points. Nine of those were frees. He's shown some good form. Like, to be fair, Conor Ryan did quite well and came out with a few very good balls as well. But Drennan also won a couple of frees. Conor, like, it was all basically no player for Kilkenny scored more than a point from play. So Drennan scored one from play. Conor Fogarty, Shane Walsh, John Donnelly, Massey Keown, Owen Cody, Dara Corcoran, Alan Murphy and Grow Dunn. So that's a good thing that you have a lot of lads contributing. It's not a great thing in, in another way. 
Um, I think Garo Dunn is looking like a very positive option this year. Gives away too many frees. I would say that that maybe that was just one day and you know one swallow doesn't a summer make. Another thing I noticed, Paddy Deegan was playing as that sort of sweeper type role coming back from number 12. And look, maybe it was the day that was in it. Both teams were trying to run it through the middle at times and both teams were struggling with it. But the amount of times that Deegan as the first receiver of the ball would just put it, put snow on it. Like the like Kilkenny didn't create a goal opportunity except for when a long free from Darren Brennan was spilled inside the six-yard box by Ty Borka, And then I think it was Matsy Cohen might have pulled on it. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he pulled and missed and then pulled again. He was disappointed he didn't finish it. So they didn't create a goal opportunity at all, which is very unusual for Kilkenny. You'd always think they'd have a few goal opportunities here and there. So I thought him playing that sort of first receiver type role, it's rugby terminology, I know it's horrible. But, you know, I think everyone, it's very vivid terminology at the same time. I'm not sure that worked. I'm not sure starting Keen Kenny wing back. And I know there are certain people locally who yeah. do not like this move at all. He whipped him early. It's not the first time he's whipped him early. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if that's working. Not sure but, where he's going to play this year, if or whether he's going to play now, because he started but right in saying he started centre forward, he was midfield, he was wing back, he's kind of caught in limbo now going into the summer. Um there's a lot like I think David Blanchfield has one of the, the half backs that's probably probably nailed down at this stage. Dara Corbin hmm. hasn't played maybe as much as I would have liked. I'm not sure if he has that kind of nailed down yet. Uh it's funny what you're saying about Paddy Deegan. Because uh, Porrick Walsh has generally been that player receiving the puck out. I don't know if he was marked a lot yesterday or whether well, he was occupied. Well, while I was saying Paddy actually started six with injuries, usually sweeps. So it, it could just be hard to tell at times yeah. what way things have been reorganised. So fair point, uh, Shams. Yeah, but Porrick Walsh has generally been the one receiving those puck outs because he's so good on the ball. He's listed at number four, but realistically he's not playing number four. He's playing that kind of floating cornerback. Barry Nash kind of style maybe where he's getting on a lot more ball and able to kind of build a few attacks and things like that but yeah you wouldn't have been blown away with Kilkenny now yesterday either uh, far far from it and they were just able to they were able to take the opportunities when they arose in the last 10 or 15 minutes but yeah they definitely wouldn't have blown you away now definitely not yeah a couple of Billy Goats in attack there just noticed Billy Ryan and Billy Drennan there can't be too many forward lines that had a couple of Billy Goats before uh Joe Butler says Grow Dunn is only 19 yeah like I mean I think he's a he's a very good talent um Darla Hans says we'll have to start playing Hoggy as a deep line playmaker as well <laughs> yeah you, you know, like if you were to if you were to sort of give an extra bit to, to Davey here you'd say one of the things he has to do is undo whatever psychological damage uh, occurred during that Munster Championship last year. So that's probably a big challenge there. How much did wind did that take out of their sales? Yeah, a fair bit, I'd say. He actually met, he mentioned it after. He just said, I know the beating uh, that was inflicted on them in the final round by Clare last year. It was tough to come back out of that place. They were doubting themselves and there were certain other issues that were bothering them. And I think we've come a long way. But I do think there's a, a road to go yet. Um, yeah, listen, they, I don't know. Nah, I, 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 I'm not. I'm not sure what to say. But I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be bowled over with confidence about Waterford going into Munster now. I have to say. Yeah. Um, okay. So next thing, then we'll talk about Division Two A. Carlo two twenty one, Derry sixteen. So that's Carlo safe and Derry are rooted to the bottom alongside Down, who lost by just a point to Kerry. So that was a very creditable performance there. And on also the other result was Offaly 217, Kildare 23. So a draw between your native county and the Lily Whites. That's huge for the Lily Whites to be into a league final directly, whereas it's going to be Offaly against uh, Kerry in the semi final this coming weekend. Yeah, Kildare had themselves in a really good position midway through the second half. I think they were six up, um, and it looked like they were going to maybe hold Offaly at arm's length. But David Daly got a goal from a, a long free that dropped in, and then Charlie Mitchell got a goal. And it was a contentious enough free at the end for for James Burke to tie it up. The ball went in, keeper kind of spilled it. And you know when you think it's obvious that someone has actually dove on, like dived on the ball or whatever. I, I didn't, he was kind of down on his knees and kind of nearly fell in on top of it or pushed in on top of it. It mm. looked contentious enough, but that's after making a big difference now. Kildare straight through to the final, awfully to play uh, a semi-final. Um, and I believe Kerry's bench was crucial in that win over down. Uh, did a massive impact off the bench. But yeah, Kildare are you know one win away from playing Division One hurling, which yeah you would like a couple of years, you know, they were they're the common team and that. But 
when they won the ring in 20 and then were relegated back down to ring at the end of 2021. So they've gone from win, they've won the Christie ring last year to potentially winning 2A this year. Like things are moving fairly well and they're probably not probably not the team we were talking about maybe going into the Joe McDonough, probably talking about Offley or probably talking about Leash maybe coming down from Lee McCarthy. But if they're going in there on the back of winning 2A, yeah, they'll think anything is possible. Yeah, and for Kerry, it was a bit of a late flurry of scores. Shane Conway, he he's finished up the game with nine points, two of those from play. And Jordan Conway, he came off the bench. I know he's had his injury uh, issues in recent times, but he scored 1-2 off the bench, which is very good shooting there altogether. Do you remember his performance off the bench in the McDonough final oh, last year? Ridiculous. Outrageous. He ended up, did he end up with 2-2 two, two or something like that? And every time he got the ball, it looked like he was going to be fouled as well. Yeah, um, Division 2B then, Donegal 118, Tyrone 117, so that's a, a nice narrow victory there. Uh, very tight game also when Meath went over to Ryslip and beat London 222 to 221. Sligo 114, Wicklow 12 points in Markovitz Park. 3A, Armagh beat Fermanagh by just a point, 317 to 316, very tight one there. Roscommon had a victory in Monaghan 119 to 14, and Mayo put up a serious scoreline against Loud. 520 to 15 points there in Darver. Division 3B. And, you know, it's not so long ago that Fermanagh uh, were beating Mayo, so Mayo seemed to have turned it around a little bit. Uh, Division 3B, Lancashire 520, Warwickshire 15 points, and Leitrim 10 points, Longford 9 in Drumshanbo. Can't imagine that was a cracker. I'd, I'd imagine the weather played a fair old uh, part in that one. So Just a quick um, one, Shane, just to go through it. So Kildare are in the final in 2A, awfully played Kerry in the semi-final. Mead are in the final in 2B. Wicklow play Donegal in the semi-final. Roscommon, who changed manager mid-season, are in the final in 3A. Uh, and they play, I think it's, yeah, Armagh and Monaghan play in the semi-final. They play the winners of them. And in 3B, Cavanagh in the final and Leitrim and Longford play in the semi-final. So all those semi-finals, along with the relegation playoff between uh, Westmead and Leach, they all take place this weekend. The, um, the Roscommon hurlers have had a fair old response since Francis O'Halloran decided that, the, you know, the commitment wasn't right and that he was going to leave the setup there. Like, it's really been an answer from them, hasn't it? Big time, yeah. They were on, I think they'd drawn one game um, and were on one point, I think, when, you know, when the when the new regime came in and they're on six now and they're straight through to the final. And that's on the back of it in the Nicky Racker Cup final last year. I don't know 100% whether... You know, they've gotten players uh, back in last year that maybe had stepped away this year. But, um, yeah, it's been a fairly emphatic response in fairness. Yeah. Um, are we moving on? Oh, yeah, a couple of the fixtures. Would you mind reading through those, please? Yeah, we'll go through a few fixtures. Uh, busy week again uh, this week. The Munster Minor, Hur Minor Hurling Championship starting. Um, seems a bit mad. It's kind of early in the time of the year for it to be starting, but that's kind of the way the world now. Clare are playing tip in Six Mile Bridge. And Waterford are playing Limerick and Fratterfield. And then on Wednesday night, the Munster Under-20 Hurling Championship starts again, starting quite early. Clare against Tip um, and Waterford. Sorry, that's that's under, yeah, that's under 20. Both those games are on uh, TG Catter's YouTube. It's Tip against Clare and Waterford against Limerick. Yeah, those are going to be big fixtures to look forward to. So we'll get to Division 1 of the football now. Armagh won, uh, I think it was 1-6 against Galway, 1-8. And throughout the second half, there was very little scoring done from from uh, Watford, or sorry, from Armagh at all. It was only an injury time, I think, they got their chance. Then they got a couple of balls into the area late on, couldn't quite get it over the line. I'd imagine they were pretty frustrated there in Armagh, watching their team labour. You know, they'd done well to turn the game around. And, um, yeah, it's just a bit of a frustrating one for Armagh. But Galway, they, like, this is really good from them to come up to, to Armagh, to win in that sort of environment and sort of come, you know, especially very tight game, being tested all the way late on. Porrick Joyce and uh, John Dively and so on, the way they celebrate on the final whistle, you could see it meant an awful lot to them. Yeah, like, the first round of the league, Galway gave away points against Mayo when they just booted the ball away and ended up getting a... You know, Mayo ended up getting a draw and score. And if you look at how they've closed out some of the games since then, they've been really professional, like really kind of ruthless as well. Closed out this game really well. Closed out the Monaghan game really well, despite being down a man. Um, this was obviously, there was none of the, the fireworks of last year's All-Ireland quarterfinal or anything like that. But, you know, I'd imagine Joyce would have learned a fair bit about his squad going up there. Hostile enough venue, tough 
game scores at a, at a premium. They're still minus the likes of Damian Comer. Obviously, Shane Walsh played, uh, made his first start of the year. Uh, it was a hard win, but I'd say they'd, yeah, I'd say they'd be delighted with it now going in. And there's a possibility of an all Connacht, uh, an all Connacht Division One final now. Should Galway get a result in the last game, it may or definitely true. They're the one team that's yeah. true, and uh, could end up playing Galway if Galway get a result at the weekend again. Mayo's scoring differential after six games, winning four, drawing two, is plus 30. That's really, really impressive. Like, they're turning themselves into goal machines. Galway are next on eight points, then Kerry and Tyrone and Ross Common are all on six, Armagh with five, and then Monaghan are on four, and Donegal are on three as well. So it's been a very disappointing season for Donegal. Did you think that Ethan Rafferty goal would sail all the way into the net and you obviously had those defend or sorry, three or four players backing into the goalkeeper? Did you think that was fair enough in terms of the goal standing. I I do. I, I think the goalie needs to start. And sorry, I think first off, the defenders need to hold their men out. You need to be strong enough as a defender to hold the men out and protect your goalkeeper as well. So I'm actually nearly uh, blaming the defenders more than I am. <laughs> uh, I'm not surprised that they launched a few bombs in with the success they got in the quarterfinal last year. And I was amazed, uh, as I know, I think you were, that Derry didn't you know pump a few high balls in until very late on against Galway in that semi final. You know, because it's obviously something that's, you know, it's maybe a potential weakness in Galway's armory. But uh, I'd I'd be big on the defensive side of things with that type of high ball. The defender needs to do his job and make sure there's no player getting anywhere near the keeper or the ball within the rules. And then the keeper needs to take all before him. And neither of those two happen. So from a defensive point of view, we'd be very disappointed. Yeah, like as a as a back there, you've got to basically be driving into the forward, body on body, Maria, I'm going for the ball, but really I'm letting letting it through. You have to be cute. I mean, this yeah. is the way to play it, you know, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you have to make. Yeah, you have to. It's an art of making it look like you're trying to go for the ball, but you're not trying to go for the ball at all. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. That, that's how you defend. It's a little bit like in soccer, whereby you're letting the ball roll out over the end line. You're just shielding the ball. It's probably the one area in the pitch you can sort of be pushing away at the attacker. And still get away with it. There are certain rules within GA as well where you'll get away with it doing there. You mightn't get away with that somewhere else. Like if that was under a puck out, you probably wouldn't get away with it. But because you're protecting the goalkeeper, you probably will. Yeah. Anyway, Kerry, Kerry beat Ross Common. That was oh sorry, Shane Walsh also uh, came back for Galway. I thought he he did some really good stuff in that game. But uh, Kerry and Ross Common won twelve to twelve. Afterwards, uh, David Clifford was saying it was a good win. Tonight it was about getting the two points and not really anything else. It's great to have Gavin White and a few of the other lads back. The panel will be getting stronger now all the time. Hopefully, this will really kick start it. We had to do our training a bit later than we would have done other years. Trying to uh, train through the league, we feel like we're getting there. Hopefully we will, I suppose, time will tell. So he got that brilliant goal in the fifth minute. A uh, great pass, actually, from Tony Brosnan in the lead-up to that. And uh, Jack O'Connor, he said that the win was a bit patchy. He said we were determined to hit the ground running. We looked really sharp early on, but then kicked away a few foolish balls in the final quarter. Ross Common are a decent team, very fit, physical, and they were never going to die. It might have been a bit hairy there in the last five minutes, but overall we deserved it. Ross Common could have had a penalty late on, couldn't they? They could have had, yeah. Uh, it was hairy. There's no point in saying any different. It was quite hairy. Um, from a Ross like Common, yourself. <laughs> yeah. From a Ross Common point of view, they would have liked to get and you know, they would have liked to get more points on the board. There's like it's 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 still ropey enough. I just want to read out the permutations here really quickly. So Donegal are in big trouble. They're on they're on three points. They're almost certainly going to be relegated. Um after that defeat to Mayo, which we'll get into. So Donegal's only hope of survival is for a three-way playoff to be forced with, with Armagh currently on five points and Monaghan, who are on four. And that would require Monaghan drawing their last game against Mayo and Castlebar and Donegal overturning a 28-point score difference deficit on Armagh. So that's not going That's not going to happen, realistically. Um, so that means Roscommon are pretty much as good as safe. But they would have liked to... You know, they've won the first three games. They've lost the next three, which is not ideal. Now, they've lost, they've lost, generally lost quite tight games. But uh, they could have got, potentially got something out of that game at the end yesterday, as you were saying. Yeah, so um, overall, I think Ross Common, they're, they're doing well. You just don't want to be getting dragged down to the bottom half of the division and then, you know, going into championship, you're feeling like, you know, we've lost three or four games in a row. Uh, the other games then, so Monaghan, you were at this one, weren't you? Or, no, or no, I was, no, I was just watching it. Um, 
disappointed disappointed from a modern point of view. It kind of got themselves in back into the game despite conceding two goals in the first mm. half. Brian Kennedy was really good uh, for Tyrone. He won the penalty, which was really well slotted away by uh, by Peter Hart. Cormac Quinn came forward from cornerback, got a belter of a goal. But all in all, Armada would have been happy enough just been three down at the break. It was two five to eight. Then with it, Jack McCarron had picked up a yellow in the first half. Got a black within a minute, 90 seconds of the second half. He was gone. Then Killian Lavelle was uh, sent off a straight red for an off-the-ball incident as well. All of a sudden, they were down to 13. And, you know, I think uh, Dizzy Ward went off with a what looked like a shoulder or an arm injury. And Manon were just down too much bod- too many bodies. And, yeah, Tyrone coasted home by, by eight in the end. Rory Canavan was good. Uh, as I said, Brian Kennedy was good. Uh, the Dazzler threw over one off his left in the second half as well, Darren McCurry. Um, and I think importantly for Tyrone, as inconsistent as, as they've been, you know, in the last probably 18 months, to back up the Kerry game in pretty good style again. Now it was 15 on 13, so they should have been. But they backed it up, you know, pretty significantly. And uh, they're in good shape now as well. Like it's, it's only like Donegal, obviously, they were beaten and they were beaten fairly handsomely by Mayo, 117 to nine points. That was in Bally Buffet. It was Mayo's first ever win in Donegal, actually. Mm. But, you know, all of a sudden they're starting to lose games at home. You know, there was all this talk about Donegal. They hadn't lost in so long up there and whatever. And now it looks like the wheels are coming off. And it's like, obviously, they're going to go down. Like you said, the, the scoring permutations just don't read properly for them at this stage but uh the Mayo scores Aidan O'Shea he scored four points including a free and a mark and Joe it was unusual to see him taking frees but he looked very good on them like to be fair he had an excellent game he was Ryan brilliant O'Donnell. yeah Ryan O'Donoghue he scored one three Matty Rand scored three Paddy Durkin scored a couple Jordan Flynn like Jordan Flynn looks like he's stepping up to be one of the best players in the country like he's got all star written all over him the way he's going at the moment, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Yeah, he's after he's after growing a few inches under Max Day. I don't know if it's to do with his role or whatever, but he's probably taking shots a lot more shots on than he would have uh, under the previous regime. Certain lads kind of flourish under new management, and he definitely looks like a lad that is. Yeah, he's he's grown into a, a really solid player now. Like he's he's a lot of the attributes to be a top player in the sense of like he's a big physical force of nature as well. He's probably only about six two, I'd say. But he's able to get up and down. He's a good feeder of the ball. He's a good kicker of the ball. Kicked a lovely score. I don't know if you saw Matty Ryan kicked a lovely one off the outside of his right yesterday as well. May all look look comfortable, I have to say, in how they're playing. Even Ryan O'Donoghue was sold on true for the goal. And he gave the defender and the keeper the eyes and then just slipped it to the other corner. Just again, just the signs of a lad of lads that are playing with a lot of confidence. And just on Aidan O'Shea as well, as good as he was on the ball. His work rate without the ball was brilliant. He, he forced a turnover on Sean Patton at one stage yesterday. He had no right to even be be near him. Um, and yeah, as much as they maybe would like, they've they've just they're just playing into the narrative of the hype building again. They they, they can't help it. Like you can't help it when you're winning. But uh, they have maybe a bit of a free shot now in the in the last round of the league and probably run the run the run the bench a bit more. And uh, the full back Shane McBrien. David McBride, uh, yeah. Very good player. Very good player. I know he was injured a lot last year, I think Aidan O'Shea said after. But they looked like they found, you know, a ready-made kind of replacement for Rushy Mullen in around the square. Yeah, I liked your man Sam Callan as well. Tommy Conroy is back this year. He doesn't look like he's lost the yard of pace. No, he, looks like he's gained, he looks like he's gained the yard. He was putting the Donegal boys, like he was sending the shivers down to the Donegal boys anytime he got the ball. He was putting them in the back foot straight away. So, yeah, signs suggest that, that uh, Mayo are going to be right in the mix. Yeah, and uh, Kevin McStay was was keen to mention that Dermot O'Connor has 100 appearances for, for, the, for the county at this stage in league and championship. So, fair play to him. Porter Porter says, Mayo look fit. Looking forward to the West Championship. Like they do look fit. Donegal, geez, things just do not look good at all. I mean, Kieran Thompson, he scored three points. So did Michael Langan. Even Oshin Gallen, when you consider that they're down, Michael Murphy's obviously retired. Patrick McBrearty is out for, like, he's out for a while. And then Oshin Gallen pulling up, going off injured late on. They're in seriously bad trouble. Paddy Carr, I feel sorry for Paddy Carr and Paddy Bradley on the sideline there. It just looks like if they ducks, they drown. And obviously within Donegal, there are so many issues at the moment. We saw what happened with Carl Lacey and the underage system as well. It just feels like things are, are spiralling in Donegal. Yeah, just the last couple of minutes of the game, they just panned to Paddy Carr and Paddy Bradley. And 
you just see like there's nothing they can say like do you know what I mean just look totally crestfallen by what's happening and you find it hard to see how they, they can turn it around really as well don't you with the personnel that they're missing um and this kind of when this kind of general kind of malaise sets in within the squad it can be very very difficult to turn around they're going to be in division two realistically next year uh, it was always going to be difficult in you know the post michael murphy era but the injuries that they've suffered and i suppose i listen to all the things that are going on behind the scenes it all feeds into it all feeds into you know a narrative of you know things not been rosy in the Donegal Garden and it definitely looks like they're not. Yeah, certainly not. Um, okay, we'll go into Division 2 now and I'll just go through the permutations. So, Louth, they, uh, they've they retained their promotion prospects. If they beat Dublin their last game at Croke Park, they'll go up ahead of the Dubs. Um, we already know that Derry are into the final as well. So, the Division, uh, let's see as well, Limerick are relegated, Clare, they're relegated as well after seven years up at this level. So, even if Clare won their last game against Limerick and Kildare lost to Meath, uh, leaving both Clare and Kildare on four points. Kildare have the head-to-head superiority there. Kildare and Meade's last round game in Newbridge next Sunday is effectively to determine who finishes sixth in the division and faces the Talchon Cup jeopardy later in the summer. Obviously, you have to come get into the final in your provincial championship if you haven't been high enough in the league. So it's uh, you know there's plenty going on there. There's lots of mouthfuls to sort of consume. But um, we'll, we'll start with um, Dublin's victory over Meath in Park Talchon. It was a hammering, wasn't it? Yeah, it was unbelievably comfortable. Uh, no point in saying any different. It was only ever one team in it. And, you know, the optimism that was around me after a couple of games has dissipated fairly quickly. Um, and, yeah, there was only ever really one team in it here. And any sign of, you know, I don't know, like who's who's the second best team in Leinster at the moment? West Meath? Really? Yeah. Uh, I don't, are loud, are loud the second best team in Leinster? <laughs> Realistically, they probably are. Yeah, you know? like Mickey Hart, what a job he's doing. Like SSRI there, you have to hand it to Mickey Hart. Great manager, surviving comfortably in a tough division. And they're getting promotion, promotion, promotion. They're looking to go all the way up to the top in successive seasons. Like, that would be what? unbelievable, really, wouldn't it? Like if they could go from, from four to one. Um, uh, the, Listen, and that's a big game because obviously that's like, that, like the last round of Division 2 games are fascinating, really, in that respect. Because... Uh, well, a few of them are anyway, because now they're going to, to Crow Park and it's basically a shootout for who's second in the group, which is brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, I have to say, yeah, now would have surprised me. If you look at how much Limerick have struggled, they only beat them a, a score or two maybe in that Division 3 final last year. Loud have prospered completely, yeah. That was a big win in RD over, over Cork, a Cork team that had been going quite well and that's taken them out of the promotion mix now. Yeah, um, for Dublin in that victory against Meath, uh, Cormac Costello scored 1-4, Killian O'Gara. Like, that was when, I think he's about 27 now. So if he was going to make his mark and really push for a place in the team, it probably has to happen very soon. And we've seen him around the panel in previous years. Obviously, his brother of Owen O'Gara, but that was an excellent performance from him. Uh, Con O'Callaghan scored four, so did Brian Fenton. Lee Gannon got a couple, and Kieran Kilkenny and Sean Bugler got one each. For Meath, it was Matthew Costello with one, two, Jack Flynn with three, Dermot Moriarty and Aaron Lynch got two apiece, but they were a mile behind throughout the game. It never felt like they could really make a match of it. I saw a lot of people criticizing them tactically, that they were sort of pushing up man on man, even when they were against the wind and not really sitting back and just trying to have a manageable deficit coming into half time. And when you consider the performance that they had against uh, Derry as well, when they were totally, they were fairly pasted as well. Oh, it just feels like any early season optimism is gone. No, it is gone. Um, and, you know, I don't know if, if there's kind of comparisons with Colin O'Rourke coming into the job in Mead and maybe even Parik Joyce coming in in Galway, where he thought Galway could play a certain way and that maybe he could go gung-ho and be, you know, you know, the eternal optimist and say, we're going to score this and whatever. But they were wide open at different stages the other day, I'd have to say. And even Pascal's run for the Costello goal at the end, like he shouldn't have got it anywhere near where he got into and put to put the ball on for Costello. He should have been there should have been someone meeting him and meeting him fairly abruptly. Yeah. Um so Derry they beat Claire 14 points to four. She's scoring four points to just it's just you know it screams comprehensive as well. That was up in Owen Beg. So Derry are up in division one for the first time since twenty fifteen. And wasn't it in twenty fourteen 
that they were in the Division One final. Yeah. I was at this game against Dublin. Mark Mark Lynch was compl- he'd been brilliant in the earlier game in the league against Dublin, and then Johnny Cooper I think completely marked him out of this particular match in the final. But they were well ahead on Dublin, or they were doing very well, and then Dublin just completely took over the match. But it was like nine points to nil at half time. I remember it wasn't at Meath against Galway, maybe last year or the year before. One of the teams, possibly Meath, had no score at half time. Right, yeah. That's but right. it's not that regular that that happens. So that, that's got to be a tough one for Colin Collins and Co. Clare were really... in a position, Shane, where they should have beaten Kildare and they should have beaten Dublin. And now they've been relegated. And that's how, that's how quickly you can turn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, got to go, lad, says uh, Joe Butler. Well done. By the way, something I had to mention earlier because uh, TV Street says uh, Vernie's money on Callum Lyons, that's for Hurler of the Year. I don't, a... think, well, I don't think Walford will get a monster, so I wouldn't be backing him for Hurler of the Year. <laughs> but do you remember that stage in the, I think it was the second, oh, was it the first or the second half, where he was Lyons was running up the field, it was the 33rd minute, right? Lyons was running up the field off the shoulder of another one of the Walford players. And he just ran straight into John Donnelly, looking for the contact, pulled Don, John Donnelly onto the floor, and Watford ended up getting an advantage out of it and eventually went back and knocked it over the ground. So when we're giving out about simulation and stuff like that, he just ran into John Donnelly, pulled him onto the ground and was like, oh, poor me. And the ref, you know, I mean, probably the ref just caught it in the corner of his eye, probably too late to realise who initiated the contact. Yeah, no, that was quite, that was quite bad, yeah. And generally... The, not, he's a defender, obviously, but the player who's attacking at that moment generally gets um, the sympathy, shall we say, or you know, whatever. And he got he got a free in that respect. And to, like John Donnelly, there was not there was nothing he could do. Like you know what I mean? It was, uh, and he looked totally bemused. And I think he tried to say it to the referee, but yeah, again, that's the situation where if the referee didn't see it, he shouldn't have called it. Um, so I don't know if he was told from his linesman or whatever, but definitely wasn't a free. It was a free the other way. Yeah, do you know, actually, when we're talking about referees buying fouls, at the end of the Armagh-Galway game, Paul Conroy was trying to burst out with a ball on the left wing, is in the far wing from the camera, and a defender came in with the hand, and he very clearly caught your man's hand and sort of running with it and trying to sort of fool the referee. Referee didn't buy it, and he actually gave a free the other way. I was very happy to see that, so fair play to him. I can't think of who the ref was off the top of my head. Um, Loud beat Cork, as you said already, won 10 to 10 points, came from behind, to end a mammoth 66-year losing streak against Cork. So that's that's quite something from Mickey Hart. He's very much working the oracle there. Uh, Limerick, they had a 2-7 to 3-10 defeat to Kildare as well. I mean, it's just not been good times for Kildare. But uh, Mark Fitzgerald, he said about this game, uh, we prepared well with the week that was in it. We obviously just had to think about Limerick GA and trying to keep Limerick in Division 2. That ultimately was the target today. We just fell short. Uh, there's plenty more from him there as well. But uh, Division 3... You might go through some of the permutations there. Yeah, plenty of different permutations going into the going into uh, the last weekend of game. So Cavanagh qualified uh, for a final despite losing to Antrim, while Fermanagh's win over Westmead makes them most likely to join them. Uh, they face Cavan this weekend, so Cavan are already through, so don't really have anything to play for in that game. But obviously they're not going to want to let one of their Ulster kind of opponents get one over them on them. Uh, obviously still have a chance of joining Cavan. However, they need to be down in the remaining fixture and hope that Cavan beat Fermanagh so that they go through on head-to-heads with Fermanagh as both will be levelled together on 10 points and at the other end of the table, Longford and Tipperary both drop to Division 4. So just fly through the results there. Antrim had a really good win over Cavan after being annihilated by Westmead uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. It finished Antrim 117, Cavan 212. Fermanagh, their form has you know, been really good this year under Kieran Donnelly. Finished 15 points to 2-8 against Westmead. So any hopes... Westmead last year's Salchon Cup winners had of promotion are now gone. And, and in a very emotionally fueled uh, day in uh, FBD Central Stadium, I finished awfully 2 14, Tipperary 13 points. So, awfully playing just six days after their their manager, Liam Kearns, passed away. Uh, Martin Murphy, who was involved with Port Harrington the last couple of years and has been a coach, was a coach under Liam, he took charge of him. And he just said after, when we met with the players, we said we wanted to come here today. And put in a performance to honour Liam Kearns. He's left a huge mark on Offaly football. He had a great football brain and lit, uh, lit a spark in that dressing room. The players want to go for promotion. If results had gone against us today, then we might have experimented a bit more against Down with a view to championship. Everyone wants to play at the highest level and the players want to get back up. So they'll have to get results, will have to go with them and they'll have to do um, 
they'll have to do their own uh, kind of keep their own part of the bargain in that but they're still in the hunt going into the last game and it was obviously of all that you know is a kind of is bizarre really that Offaly would be playing Tipperary six days after Liam's pass and had left such a massive mark in Tipperary and even in the seven the, I think it's seven months since he was named Offaly manager he's left a massive mark in Offaly as well yeah, he sure has. So, uh, as you said, they're awfully and down. Both of them could potentially get into the, the final, depending on results. But Cavan are playing for Mana, and both Cavan and for Mana are two points ahead of down and awfully. And they play each other this weekend. So, one of them will absolutely be true. If they draw, they'll both be true. Sod's law, it's going to be a draw, isn't it? Last Probably. 10 minutes. <laughs> Probably. Last 10 minutes of the game, they're going to be handball just at one end of the field. The other team camped at the other end. I mean, it could happen. It could happen. Like, if you were. If you were there and you had heard that, you know, either of the two teams that uh, could get through to the final on head to head or whatever way the permutations are there at the moment, that you're like, hey, lads, look, we just handball this around here and we'll, we'll see you again next or in a couple of weeks for the final. That happened in a World Cup match one time. Uh, yeah, so it happened, yeah. They changed the rule back, I think, around 82 or something like that. One team, possibly someone like Congo, or so, I think it was an African team, got screwed over by two teams just deciding to draw. So, the way it was back then, it was like the games were like even the final round of games, they were played at staggered times. So they changed the rule after that so that the games would have to happen simultaneously in the final round. But it happened in Euro 2004 that Denmark and Sweden played out a 2-2 draw. It had to be that exact scoreline <laughs> and that would knock out Trapattoni's Italy. And they did it. And it was, you know, they sold everyone a pop. It was yeah, totally yeah, them just yeah. playing out that result for a finish. <laughs> Mad, so, yeah, that? yeah. So we'll see what happens between Cavan and Fermanagh in that match. Um, was did you read out the Anton Sullivan quotes as well from? Offaly? No, I didn't. know. just a nice quote from Anton. Obviously, he's one of the kind of most longest serving Offaly players. He just said it's been an emotionally tough week. It really hit home when we returned to training and Liam wasn't there. Martin Murphy had stepped up with an excellent backroom team. They wanted to drive on uh, the great work Liam started, and yeah, listen, it was great to get a, uh, a win at the weekend, and it's still in the promotion hunt. Yeah, and t- both Tipperary and Longford are both relegated. They're on a point each to. Suffered some heavy defeats down, beat Longford 119 to 14 points. Uh, Division four, then I'll just read through the results and you might give the permutations then. Uh, Sligo had a 210 to 11 points win over Carlo. Watford, they had a big win over London. It's their 292 5, first victory in 665 days uh, competitively. Wexford, 19 points. Wicklow, 213, a draw. And Leitrim, 214. Leash, 18 points. So that's a huge win for Leitrim there. And, Leash, I'd imagine Billy Sheen's pulling his hair out at this stage, but you might go through some of the permutations. Yeah, so we Sligo on 10 points, and we have Leitrim, Leash, and Wicklow all on 8 points. So that leads to going into the last match. Sligo topped the group on 10 points, and they meet Leitrim, who are on 8 points in the final round. But if Leitrim were to win, and Leash and Wicklow won their games against London and Waterford, respectively, as they'd expect be expected to do, four teams would then be locked on 10 points with score difference determining promotion as it is Leitrim, Sligo and Leash a vastly superior score difference to Wicklow so listen it's, it's great that there's so much going on in all the divisions that really brings it down to their wire like it's the opposite of the Hurling League really isn't it you know where um, like we only had one Division 1 game out of six that really meant anything last weekend uh, whereas across the four divisions here we've got nearly every game means something you know yeah, we managed to get a fair bit of chat out of those hurling matches that didn't matter too much, though, all the same. Yeah, didn't we? to be fair, we did, yeah. To be fair, we did, yeah. Yeah, no better, lads, to do a bit of jawing about hurling. Just a reminder that we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you get 15% off. By the way, if you uh, if you want to get a live club fundraiser at your club, uh, contact us, events at ourgame.ie, and we'll bring a fundraiser to your club. Um, do you know what? As ever, we haven't prepared it. Uh, go to the week. Um, yeah, mine is uh, Anthony Ireland Wall for Cairns, and from a football point of view, I'd probably go with Aidan O'Shea, who looks as good as he has ever looked this year. Right, I'll give it to Aidan O'Shea as well, because I haven't had a chance to think this one through, <laughs> and who else will I give it to? Adam Screeny. We'll give it to Adam Screeny, yeah, he's been flying it. Okay, that's it from the show today, we'll see you again on Thursday, if you want to get the audio podcast, it's on Patreon. Thanks Michael. Cheers, Jen.